Well, I, formally, I will open the, the, this meeting of the Fairfield City Council as a retreat and look forward to some very productive discussions and some good actions. So we'll call the meeting to order, please. Madam Clerk, if you would do the roll call, please. Council Member Bertani. Here. Council Member Moy. Here. Council Member Pandero. Here. Council Member Tim. Here. Council Member Tonneson. <clears throat> and Vice Mayor Vaccaro. Here. And Mayor Price. Here. Did you hear me? Thank you. And we'll do some introductions. Mr. City Manager, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. And welcome, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council to the uh, this year's retreat. This is a little different than what we've uh, done in years past, obviously, because of the pandemic. Um, under your direction, we will be doing a series of uh, three or four hour Zoom meetings. Our first three are scheduled for today, tomorrow, and then uh, I believe February uh, 8th uh, in the evening. Uh, today's meeting agenda is as follows. After my introductions, we will uh, open it up for public comment. This will be the only point during the meeting where we will solicit the public's comments and where they will be uh, given an opportunity to speak on uh, any item, whether it's on the agenda or not on the agenda. They, this is their open time to, uh, to have that, uh, that opportunity. It'll be handled just as any other public meeting where public comment is uh, is, uh, is open. Uh, Amber will manage that, uh, I believe, and will uh, let those individuals in the room when it becomes their turn to speak. After the public comment closes, we will then go to um, the department overviews. Uh, first will be police, uh, after the police department fire, after fire public works, then parks and rec, then community development, and then housing. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, housing's uh, department report, uh, we will conclude the meeting until tomorrow morning. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information that will be pushed to you during these first two days of retreat. Uh, once, uh, and once the uh, uh, presenter is done making their presentations, and what we ask from the council is as the various department heads are giving their presentations, they've prepared about 10 to 15 minutes of a formal presentation to you. And then after that time, we open it up for your questions and some discussion on some of the things that they've talked about or anything that has to do with their department. We wanna maintain um, no more than 30 minutes per uh, department uh, so that we can uh, continue to move through. Otherwise we'll be here until uh, the early morning hours of tomorrow morning, uh, just trying to get through today's agenda. So. The other thing that we want to, uh, again, make clear is that um, there is no action being taken during today's meeting. Therefore, there is no public comment during each of the, uh, uh, the different department uh, head reviews that, that, that are going to be going on. So we'll not be soliciting any public comment after that public comment period at the beginning of the meeting. There'll be no opportunity for them to talk about those things. This is in line with past um, retreats. The retreat is different from a council meeting. If there were actionable items on the agenda, then the Brown Act does require and we do solicit public comment uh, for those action items. But because there are no action items, uh, there will be no public comment uh, for today. On tomorrow's agenda, just really quickly, there will be one uh, area where there is action uh, that is under the mayor's committee appointments. And during that period, uh, public comment will be allowed uh, for that particular item, uh, but again, uh, not for the other uh, reports. Any questions for me on that? With that, Mr. Mayor, uh, we've got uh, quite a bit to cover, so I will, uh, I'll conclude that and uh, we can move on with the agenda. Okay, so do, public comments, we want to start with that, Amber? Yep, yes. so. Yeah. Persons wishing to address the city council on subjects not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Council cannot discuss or take action on matters not on the agenda for this meeting. The council members may briefly respond to statements or questions raised by the public, ask for clarification from staff, refer the matter to staff, request staff to report back to the council at a subsequent meeting or place the matter on a future agenda. When joining the meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature or press star nine on your phone to request to speak. 
You will be called on by name and have three minutes to speak. Members of the public wishing to submit their comments via email can email cityclerk at fairfield.ca.gov. These comments will be forwarded to council for review, but will not be read aloud during the meeting. Okay. So our first speaker, it looks like we have um, Jeanne McDougall. Um, so go ahead, Jeanne. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning council and um, everyone who's listening. Um, I'm gonna uh, just kind of do kind of a good neighbor uh, comment. And that is to, has to do with uh, getting ready for any kind of disaster. And I think it's really important for people to know their neighbors and, and to get alerts and to know what to do and to make a plan to protect your, your people, uh, get to safety with things you need, stay safe at home when you can't leave. But also I wanna speak uh, just really quickly about the vaccine where a lot of older people are not able to maneuver in uh, uh, different kinds of um, the internet or anything else. And, and as a good neighbor, contact your neighbor so that you can help them sign up to get the vaccine. Uh, we, we just need to be just more cognizant about older people uh, in this community, which um, I have found, you know, uh, I'm, I hate to say it, but as a veteran, I feel as if, you know, the, 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 uh, the VA and, the, and Travis Air Force Base has neglected a lot of people. But get to know your neighbor, um, help them uh, get with the vaccine, help them to be prepared for any kind of uh, natural disaster. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the council and um, and all that you do uh, for the community. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be Rick Wood. Good morning. Um, I just want to congratulate the council and the city on the nearing completion of the East-West Water Transmission Pipeline. Uh, that's a project we conceived of in 1986. And it's been done in phases as money was uh, available. And I'm glad, very glad to see it's nearing completion. I read about it in the newspaper. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. All right, we have next um, Bob Karn. Go ahead, Bob. Hi, my name is Bob Karn, and I'm a property owner of several pieces of property on West Texas Street, as well as a business owner here in town for 30 years. And I'm very proud to be a member of the city of Fairfield business community. And the purpose of my call today is just to ask you to keep your police department at the forefront of your decisions when it comes to funding. I place a great deal of value in your police department with my buildings on West Texas Street, without your police department, I would have some very serious issues. So I respect and honor your department and ask you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, looks like we have no other speakers. That's it. So we'll begin with the department presentations, please. All right, first we have, let's see, um, Deanna. Let me find Deanna, one second. All right, Deanna. Okay, good morning. Let me see if I can share my screen. Did you need that ability, Amber? Yes. Okay. You see the green button at the bottom? Just hit that. There you go. We can see it. It's coming up. Let me turn that into a... Oops. I'm not on the first slide. Let me go up to the first slide. Okay. I think I got it. Can you see the first slide there? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. 
So good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm Deanna Cantrell. I'm your police chief and I'll be doing a, a presentation and update for you on the police department. The city of uh, Fairfield is, as you know, just about 42 square miles and that's what we police for you and for our community um, and what we're responsible for. We have that 42 square miles broken up into five PSAs or public service areas, uh, if you will. Currently, uh, two of those PSAs, the central and the south PSAs, account for 62% of all of the calls for service in the city of Fairfield. So we are working on redefining those boundaries. Uh, we're looking at all of the grids within the entire city. The city is broken up by grids. So we're looking at all of the calls for service in every one of those grids, and we're going to work on redefining those boundaries so that they can be more equitable for workload. And then we are going to uh, break them down into smaller areas that will be uh, responsible areas for, for police officers. So we are made up of 100, 198 full-time staff, 125 of those are sworn, 73 are professional. We do have a lot of volunteers. They haven't been with us, unfortunately, for the last year because of COVID, but we will be excited to get them back with us. Uh, our mission is a new mission. And I'm going to read that to you. Uh, you're going to see this concept of reducing harm. You'll hear that from me uh, throughout my tenure uh, with Fairfield. You will hear that from me, and I have a strong belief in that concept. So, uh, our mission is with reverence for human life being the first thing, that the, the first priority for us is pre preservation of life. So, with reverence for human life and the highest degree of ethical and professional conduct, the Fairfield Police Department will while working in partnership and as guided by the constitution, safeguard the lives and property of the people we serve, we will enforce the law and we will reduce harm to make our community safe for all. So our goals, we have an overarching theme of reducing harm and we accomplish reducing harm. I, I, I firmly believe that the more that we can prevent from happening, the better, the better quality of life we'll have in Fairfield, the less victimization we'll have, the less use of force we'll have, the less people uh, will less people will be entering the criminal justice system if we can have good preventative work and good preventative programs, which does reduce uh, harm. So we reduce harm, and th these will be our five uh, goals over the next year. But we re will reduce harm by first reducing crime and homelessness and the fear of crime. And so reducing crime will reduce harm to victims. It reduces uh, harm to communities and would be offenders also because they aren't entering the criminal justice system. And it also reduces harm for law enforcement. We'll use less force. There's less uh, opportunities for conflict with our community. Uh, we are working on a data-driven intelligence-led policing approach. Uh, we don't currently practice that, but we are moving toward that and it will reduce crime and it will reduce harm in our community. Homelessness, uh, you're going to see later on in the presentation that the homeless uh, intervention team helped to house over 130 people. And I know that number doesn't seem uh, large, but it really, really is significant when you think about 130 different lives. Uh, that were really saved uh, by being housed. And, uh, and, then, and then reducing the fear of crime. The fear of crime uh, is, is harmful because community members quit going out into their community and they don't own their community when they have fear of crime in their communities. And so that's about giving communities back to, back to the people. Uh, we are working on a lot of prevention processes, policies, programs, you're, you're going to hear about over the next uh, several years. We are working on some alternative and restorative justice programs. One of the restorative justice programs we're currently working on is a neighborhood court. Um, neighborhood court, Fair, uh, Vacaville and Vallejo both have that. We did not. It's going to take us about six months to get it. That's a restorative justice program through the, through the DA's office. And then we're also working on um, another alternative program that's similar to our youth diversion program. It's a program that's out of uh, Colorado and I was speaking to the public defender about that just the other day. So we have a meeting to talk about that further. Another way that we reduce harm in Fairfield is by increasing multimodal safety. And I say multimodal because we, you know, we get around a lot of different ways by bike, by foot, uh, on motorcycles, in vehicles. And you're going to see later in the presentation that we had over 1,000 accidents in the last year. That's a lot of collisions. Collisions cause a lot of harm. They cause injury, they cause death, they reduce work time, they increase costs to families. And so increasing multimodal safety is critical and our traffic unit and patrol officers are 
are responsible for reducing that harm. We reduce harm by increasing trust and we fully understand uh, that we cannot be fully effective without the trust of our community. And I, uh, I believe in large part, we do have that trust from our community, from everybody that I've been able to talk to in my, my short time here. I think we do have high trust, but certainly we don't have the trust of everyone. And I understand we, we never will have the trust of everyone, but we will we'll work for it. Uh, and we will listen and we will work with our community. We are going to be starting some additional um, community programs. One of the things that we're working on right now with the city manager is on our citizen audit committee that's been expanded um, and that's gonna help provide oversight for our citizen complaints. And then we reduce harm by increasing our regional partnerships and strengthening those. Not, not only our partnerships with law enforcement agencies, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, which is critically important for us to all communicate and share information, but also increasing our partnerships with our nonprofits, with businesses, with our community members, with Fairfield uh, Sassoon Unified School District, all of those are incredibly important. And then uh, lastly, we will reduce harm by, by uh, strengthening our own health and our own wellness. If we want our staff to provide, as mentioned in our mission to provide quality service with the highest degree of ethical and professional conduct, they have to be healthy mentally and physically and spiritually. And so we are going to have a strong focus on our mental health and wellness within the police department. So the police department is broken up into two divisions. First is operations, the other is administration. I'll, I'll just go over these briefly. You can take a look at each of those bullets within each of those, uh, each of those blue boxes, but that's not everything they do, but I, I, that's about all the room I have. So, uh, so patrol is, is what you typically see in a black and white vehicle out there answering calls for service. You're gonna see in a little bit that patrol officers responded to and answered 92,000 calls for service. I have 52 staff in patrol. So 52 staff in patrol and along with a few others, traffic and some others uh, answered 92,000 calls for service. That's a, a lot of calls for service for the city of Fairfield and the city is, is growing. And so certainly that will be in one of our challenges. Uh, traffic safety is responsible for decreasing multi or increasing multimodal safety. And so you can see some of the things they do there. They do that in a number of different ways. Investigations, it's housed in a separate building. We'll talk about our facility in just a little bit. Uh, and under the investigations umbrella, umbrella uh, are, is victim adv advocacy. They're responsible for further investigating crimes that patrol generally starts with. So a, a call for service will start with patrol. If they can't bring that to a full conclusion, which many of the times it's difficult to do, those will be forwarded over to investigations. They also um, do all of our fraud investigations. They do child crime and sex crime investigations. They do uh, human trafficking investigations. Uh, we have victim advocacy there. So a lot goes on in investigations. You're all very familiar with the homeless intervention team. Uh, that is made up of four officers, a sergeant and a mental health social worker. A lot of great work coming out of the uh, homeless intervention team. Special operations is a, a part of investigations. That's gang and narcotic investigations that are conducted in the investigations building, as well as victim services is also there. We have a K-9 unit. It's actually not its own separate unit, but it is a part of patrol. We have five K-9s in total. Four of those are patrol uh, K-9s, and then one of them is an electronics dog uh, and also peer support or comfort animal uh, for the police department and for the community. And then emergency services falls under operations and that's our SWAT team, crisis negotiations, mobile field force, those types of units that you uh, saw quite a bit of over the last year. The other side of the house is support services. Uh, support services is made up of crime prevention. Jeremy Prophet is our supervisor manager over crime prevention and code enforcement. He does an incredible job. Uh, crime prevention is something that I love. When I talk about reducing harm, uh, crime prevention is a tremendous part of that because the more we can prevent and uh, our pillars and our beliefs and our principles, uh, first is a preservation of life. And second is that uh, crime prevention is more important than making arrests because if we can prevent it from ever happening, then we don't have to make arrests. And so we are going to work hard on crime prevention over the next several years. We have social media and PIO, Jeremy Prophet oversees social media. We have several PIOs. One of those, the main one is one of our lieutenants. 
uh, you can see the number of, uh, of millions of people that we've reached with our social media. Our facilities, we have five different facilities. So we have the training facility, the PAL Center, which you all I'm sure are familiar with and, and know that we have to have that moved from Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District uh, by April of next year. So we are looking uh, for a new location for the PAL Center. We have our evidence building, which uh, you just approved a continued lease on for the next five years. And then we have our investigations uh, building. We are trying to work to get more of our staff under the same roof. There will be a, a plan for an expansion of the police facility um, in the next several years while I'm, while I'm here. And then communications is dispatch. Uh, dispatch is incredibly busy. They took almost 300,000 phone calls came through that dispatch center. That's 17 people uh, that answered almost 300,000 calls last year. Records is incredibly busy. All of our paperwork, PRAs, uh, all of that goes through records. And then admin and finance is our administrative staff and our finance analyst. Code enforcement is under Jeremy Profit as well. They do an incredible amount of work in the city. There's not very many of them. There's four of them, plus a supervisor, Dan, who does a great job. Um, and they get a lot, a lot of compliance uh, through cooperation and voluntarily without having to go to citing people. So I just love that. And then property and evidence, uh, which is incredibly busy with all of the workload that we have. And then last with the admin or support services is youth services. And that's our PAL program, our youth diversion, which uh, is, is really incredible and something that uh, I think we're the only youth diversion program in the, in the county. And then of course, all of our SROs are in that as well. So this is just some, some uh, facts and figures. So our budget is uh, 46 million. It's 85% staffing and 15% non-staffing or operational costs. You, you can see all those numbers on the side there. Um, what's of note, I need to move my picture so I can see. Uh, what's of note is the almost 300,000 phone calls that were taken by dispatch. The total calls for service that came through that center were 106,000 with the police department uh, having 92,000 of those. And then you can get down to uh, homeless calls at 5,308. We're gonna do a really good job of collecting data over the next year. So by the end of this year, I should have some really uh, great data to be able to share with you. But that's a decrease from the prior year. 5,308 is a decrease from last year, which is what we wanna see and what we're gonna continue to work toward. And then homeless housed 136. Gun violence, you see that. I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. So this is uh, part one crime. Part one crime is what we're responsible for reporting every year. Police departments report this through, through the Department of Justice every year. I'll give you a little a breakdown. Part one crime is broken down into two categories, violent and property. So violent crime is murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Property crime is burglary, larceny, or theft and vehicle theft, which is stolen vehicles. And then burglary is further broken down into three categories, which is commercial burglaries, residential and vehicle burglaries. So I did notice an error. So let me point that out. Uh, the crime per thousand in 2019 should have been 37.6. In 2020, it is 31.6. And our county average for Solano County is 31.9. So we're just under, uh, we're just under at 31.6. Um, for 2020, our, our county average. Uh, crime did come down, you see that. Crime overall came down 15%, which is good. It's very good for our part one crime to come down. That is a one way we, we reduce harm. But what you need to notice is that violent crime went up 25%. That's not an anomaly to Fairfield. That is all over our county, all over our state, all over our nation. We had the most murder suicides in the nation that we've ever seen. Um, we had the highest amount of gun violence in the nation that I've ever seen. When all the homicide numbers from all of the cities around the nation come in, I think we're going to see incredible increases. For us, specifically, our shootings went up 57% from 72 to 113. Violent crime using a gun went up 47% and gun arrests. So we are arresting people. We are proactively working to reduce that harm. Our gun arrests went up 27%. Um, but it, there's a lot of violence and where there's a lot of guns, there's a lot of violence. And so that is something we are working on and we will work on uh, for the years to come. Property crime came down 20%. 
The category that came down the most is theft. It makes perfect sense with COVID and businesses being closed. Um, there weren't a, as many opportunities for thefts. And so people that would have likely shoplifted went and committed other crimes. So burglary went up, vehicle thefts went up. Uh, so the only property, uh, property crime that came down was thefts. And then this is the last slide. These are our issues and challenging. So the challenges. So of course, uh, continuing to meet our community's needs and our community's needs are changing. Fairfield is growing. Um, I am looking at all of the growth in the city and the increase in population, which will uh, equate to an increase in calls for service for the police department and, and will increase our workload in every single area. So I'm looking at that. That will be a challenge for us in the years to come. Uh, increases in violent crime are, are incredibly concerning. Um, uh, the civil unrest that we've had over the last year and, and that continuing this year is, is a challenge. And then of course, uh, the increases in calls for service with our, our limited resources, but maintaining fiscal responsibility is challenging. Our homeless and transient related impacts, we are, uh, we are working hard and, and I think doing a very good job on that. Uh, we are partnering right now with the county for a mobile crisis unit. Fairfield and Sassoon are the first two cities that are going to see that mobile crisis unit and be able to use it. We should, I hope by the end of February, they're in the process of hiring people now. So I think by the end of February, we should have the mobile crisis unit up and running. And we're working on the protocol right now to determine, because most of those calls come in through dispatch, we're determining how dispatch will uh, figure out which calls they can send directly to mobile crisis. So law enforcement doesn't have to go to those at all. That is ultimately the goal is to get as many mental health related calls as possible out of the hands of law enforcement and into the hands of, of the mobile crisis unit. Uh, I think initially we will have a lot of co-responses. I think uh, mental health and, and the police department will respond together until we all figure it out, but I do see that coming in our future. Uh, I talked about the increases in violent crime uh, and I talked about our intelligence led uh, and, and um, and data-driven uh, crime-fighting philosophy and, and what we're working toward as a ComStab model, uh, and that will reduce crime. I, and I've I experienced that in both of my prior police departments. Uh, increasing legitimacy and trust, this is a, a must for us, and we will continue to work on that. I have a lot of ideas for programs uh, that will start. Our facility space needs, um, talked about that. We need a long-term solution for POW, we need a long-term solution for our evidence and the storage needs. Uh, and then we, we definitely have a need to increase space in our current police department where we are grown out of. Uh, and then strategic plan development, we're working on that. We will have a strategic plan that will be a five-year plan uh, over the next, uh, we should have that developed in the next year. Uh, we have a lot of staffing challenges, hiring challenges, recruiting challenges, as you can imagine, there's a lot of legislative impacts uh, that are coming our way that don't generally have funding that come with them. Uh, and so we'll have to navigate those as well while we maintain our fiscal responsibility. So uh, that is it for me. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'm answering questions, colleagues. Thank you. Yes. Councilwoman yeah. Moy, please. Oh, hi. Thank you, Chief, very much. <clears throat> I was wondering, first of all, could we um, all get copies of this so we could have it? Um, it was really well done. <clears throat> I really appreciate what you've done. And frankly, I am shocked to know that we have not been using data. Um, this is something I brought up to two past city managers. Um, and ask for it to happen, and obviously it didn't. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, it's going to bring changes. Um, you're very smart, I like that. Um, I had a question, what is Neighborhood Court exactly? So Neighborhood Court is a program that Vacaville and Vallejo have. It's a restorative justice program. So we used it actually for the folks that were arrested at council, um, yes. I called. Krishna Abrams, the DA, and we talked about the fact that we don't have the program, but we asked if we would be allowed to use Vacaville's program just for those folks, if they wanted to use it. Uh, it is voluntary. 
So what it is, is um, a restorative justice program is basically a program that aims to get offenders to take responsibility for their actions and to understand the harm that they caused, but also to give them an opportunity to redeem themselves uh, th without going through the criminal justice system. And so they would end up without having any kind of record. Uh, and so it's limited to only a certain uh, a number of crimes. You can't have a long criminal history. Uh, there are certain criteria that will prevent some people from going into that restorative justice program. But I think there's a lot of at least misdemeanor offenses uh, that we probably can run through that program and then keep people from getting a criminal history who you know, maybe just mess up one or two times in their life. Okay, I, I really, uh, I like the sound of it. That's good. I did notice that um, the people who are arrested are not in the court system. Um, I've looked them up and one of them is now working for the public defender's office. So that's interesting. Um, so uh, the citizen audit committee, um, are you making changes to that or just expanding or what are we doing? So the Citizen Audit Committee actually got changed um, by council back in, I think, and Greg, you, I don't have that data pulled up, but I think it was 2000, and it was originally originated, I think, in 1997, and then wow. there were changes made in 03 or 05, I'd have to go back and look at the exact date to get it for you, but um, we're just implementing all of those uh, changes and, and making a couple of others um, that we thought were meaningful. The It's going to and this is, of course, the city manager um, is oversees the, the citizen audit committee and, and these decisions have been his. And so he uh, graciously has, um, has allowed these changes and, and um, is, is selecting the people that are going to serve on this, on this um, audit committee. So the changes are going to be that um, they will get to look at a case before I adjudicate it. That hasn't happened previously. Previously, they looked at it after it was completely uh, finished at the police department. And so if they didn't agree with it, they really weren't given a voice to be able to explain why they didn't agree with the outcome. And so this way, they'll be able to look at those complaints that rise to that level uh, and, and then give, and either concur or not concur with the captain's findings. And then they'll be able to communicate that to me prior to my making a final adjudication. Very good. And the last question I have, I actually have a million, but of course we don't have all the time. Uh, as far as violent crime, because it's gone up, does that have to do, um, is there any thinking that it has to do with the pandemic? I know that um, there have been a lot of uh, murder suicides um, around the country here also. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, has there been any talk about that with people who know about crime and know about uh, psychology? There is a lot of discussion nationally. I serve on an international uh, association of chiefs of police committee. And so there are chiefs from all over the nation and even from other countries that are on that uh, committee. And so we have talked about that. There's nothing empirical yet that is, is definitively saying uh, it's related to uh, COVID and the pandemic, but it is curious. This is the highest increase we've ever seen in a year over year. Uh, in violent crime. And uh, in part, a lot of it, we have a lot of polymer guns or ghost guns. Uh, yeah. We are recovering a lot at CHP is recovering a lot. Vallejo at our last chief's meeting, we had a discussion about that, how many guns we are all recovering and how many of them are 3D printed uh, guns. And so, you know, the technology has a bit to do with that. And I would imagine the pandemic does, but I think we'll know more over the next year as we watch this year start to unfold and start to look at the uh, crime numbers from this year. Thank you so much, Chief. Absolutely, and one I just wanted to address on the data, uh, the police department has been using the data, it's just that I love data, <laughs> probably unlike most people. And uh, I came from a police department that practiced ComStat, it's a LAPD model that I learned. Uh, and so it's just a different philosophy and model that I'll be bringing to us. And we'll use data in a, in a lot of different ways to get to the root causes and figure out what's really going on in our community. So they have been using it. Yes. Uh, we're just, we're just going to take it to a new level. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief, for a detailed presentation. I have a question about um, the mobile crisis unit. Could you just 
touch on that? Who would make up the mobile crisis unit and what the, the type of calls you're going to be going to? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the mobile crisis unit is being um, developed through the county. It's Dr. Grammy is uh, the name of the person that's overseeing the mobile crisis unit. And she's been doing a great job putting it together. I, I believe it's from grant funding and then funding through the county. So the cities are not putting any funding toward that, at least right now. Uh, they are not initially going to operate 24 hours, seven days a week, which we would love if we can get to that. Looking at the calls for service that Fairfield and Sassoon have, uh, they're going to cover the vast majority of a day. I think they it, it's either four or six hours a day that they um, will not be available to us. So we would respond to all of those mental health calls. You know, that's kind of in the late, late night, early morning kind of hours uh, where we where we'll have less of those calls, hopefully. So the way it's going to work, I don't know if you've heard of the CAHOOTS program in uh, Oregon. There's another program in Denver called STAR. Um, I think it's going to be modeled after that at some point. Right now, we're just trying to figure out, you know, when calls come into dispatch, how do we determine which ones can go directly to mental health and, and don't have a safety issue? Because, you know, the fear is, I think for everybody, is the initial fear of, okay, we have civilian mental health uh, crisis um, workers going to these uh, these calls for service and getting people the mental health that they, uh, services that they need. But where does it cross the line and should the police be involved when they're, you know, and how do you determine when there's a safety issue in advance? You might not learn it until you get there. And so I think initially we're going to find that we probably have a lot of co-response, but I do think eventually as we start to iron that out and get that figured out better, um, that's why we're just piloting it in Fairfield and Sassoon first before we roll it out to uh, Vacaville and Vallejo and Dixon and the rest of the county. Okay, thank you. Any well, other comments, colleagues? Or Chief, uh, yes, Councilwoman Bertani, did you have a comment, please? Sir, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for a great report. And I just would ask if you can drill down some on the legitimacy and trust aspect of the upcoming challenges. Do you have any specific programming in mind that maybe you've used in your prior police um, departments that would address th that concern in Fairfield? Yes, ma'am, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so. There's lots of programs. Uh, the ones that I have in mind, one of them is um, in, in Mesa, it was called Community Forums and LAPD uses this, San Francisco has it. There's quite a few agencies that use a, a kind of a community forum aspect. Um, in, in San Luis Obispo, I used it, but it was a much smaller community and I'll probably do some uh, culmination of the, of the two of them. It's where we get our most marginalized community members and those that don't have high trust uh, in the police department into the room together. Uh, and we have conversations, open, honest conversations about policing. We talk about use of force. Uh, we talk, and, and, and we do training for the community that wants the training. We'll, we'll teach them about the Fourth Amendment about use of force case law, Graham v. Connor, Tennessee v. Garner, the law, the AB 392 and 230 that just recently passed, and talk about the law and, and, and the standard that we are held to in use of force, the difficulty in policing, uh, in, in getting put in situations that are rapidly unfolding, and there's so many things that are unknown, um, and those kind of safety challenges will we'll offer for them to go through um, go through that training, uh, the, the use of force training. And then we will also learn from the community. So we had training from the community on cultural competencies. We had uh, one of our imams from our um, mosque that came in and did a cultural competency training for Muslim community. We had the LGBTQ community that came in and did training for us on the transgender community. We had autism specific training. Um, I had all of my staff, and I will work on this here, to have all of the staff through CIT training. It's crisis intervention training. It's a 40-hour class. And then there's a character-based policing and a principled policing class that I would love to get all of our staff through. The principled uh, policing was developed by Kamala Harris, 
And she uh, partnered with the DOJ, the California Department of Justice and Stanford to develop that class. It's really exceptional. It's an eight hour class, but it, it introduces, it talks about history, police, law enforcement history and the ugly history of law enforcement and legitimacy and why, uh, why historically um, communities of color in particular have distrust and that distrust continues not just because of our history, but because of current day events. Uh, so it gets into that, it gets into a implicit bias. And so it's really a, a great class. And what I saw in San Luis Obispo is when I had a culmination of all of those things, um, we watched our use of force, we cut our use of force there in half. Uh, now San Luis Obispo doesn't use a lot of force, neither does, um, neither does Fairfield, frankly. I think our use of force accounts for 0.4% of all of our calls for service. So 99.6% of the time, on a call for service, we don't have any force, which is darn close to perfect. It's close to 100%, 99.6%. So it's not that we use a lot of force, but but the less we can use, the better. That reduces harm. And so uh, studies have found there's a, a something called the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing that studies uh, scientific, they're scientists, and that's what they study is, is uh, policing. And they study what works and doesn't work because there's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of uh, things that are thrown out there and people are like, oh, you need this kind of training. But in fact, there's no study that has shown that training changed anything in a police department. And so what I'm using is stuff from evidence-based policing that has shown to work, character-based policing, CIT principle-based policing, all of those things, I think in culmination together um, will start to change policing internally. And then having those communications and starting to build those relationships with the community and bringing them in on policies. Um, I worked with the community on our, on our hate crimes, bias crimes policy, on our unmanned aerial vehicle policy, on all kinds of policies, on our immigration policy, things that affected that community um, got to come in and look at our policy and we made changes that were meaningful to them. Uh, so I, I, there's a whole lot of stuff and I for just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll cut it off there. Thank you, Chief. I just want to reinforce and encourage that kind of programming because it sounds like it is primarily relationship building based. And that works in Fairfield. That works here. Building yep. relationships with our community members um, is worth its weight in gold here. So I, I encourage it and look forward to a, a fairly rapid um, rollout of the programming. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And Chief, I just have one quick question for you. How would you assess the mutual aid that you're experiencing in Fairfield for Solano County and the CHP? Uh, it's been great. Uh, Steve West is the, the commander for CHP in this area. Him and I talk regularly. Uh, but not just, not just he and I, I've talked with Vacaville chiefs. The chiefs here all communicate well. Uh, and we have, we've trained together, which is really, really important uh, that we also don't just communicate, but train uh, together. And so from what I've seen since I've been here, uh, and we have had a few mutual aid incidents, um, both where we've asked people to come here and where mostly where we've gone and helped others, uh, but we do have strong mutual aid. Thank you, Chief. Excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Very reassuring. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if, uh, if that's uh, all of the questions for Chief Cantrell, uh, we, uh, we recommend going back and reopening the public comment period. Uh, as Amber um, and I was watching the hands raise as well, when the final um, speaker spoke, there were no more hands up. And so Amber indicated that looks like that's it. As soon as she said that and turned it back over to you, several hands went up. And so we recommend reopening the public comment period to ensure that those individuals have that opportunity. And then, uh, and then we can proceed with the next uh, presentation after that's complete. Okay, we will do that. Amber, if you would, please. Thank you, Stefan. All right, we have um, Mari Bowie. Um, go ahead, Mari. 
Hi. Um, first of all, you should not publish where anybody works as an organizer. That is extremely dangerous, Catherine Moy. How dare you? Second, I have a few issues that I'd like to address. Please give me one second because I was not expecting to speak right now. Um, oh, yeah. So some of the issues that we have noted is like the hit team. The hit team has noticed that many of the houses are dealing with issues that the police cannot even effectively respond to, such as like mental illness and financial instability. So we want to address the ineffectiveness of hit. Um, the only indicator of support that they are finding is like temporary shelter for 145 people and only 19 were reconnected with family. Um, they also indicated that they cleaned up 140 encampments and made 37 citations and arrested six people. Um, Officer Mike Ambrose also stated very clearly that they are first and foremost in the business of policing and not providing services. So we have a few questions such as like, who or what does a hit team even serve? Is it considered a success for the city? Are there assessments conducted by any ent entity that's not HIT or the police? Um, does there exist any other data regarding the HIT team? Where does the city track the activities of HIT? What is the average number of houses encampment cleanups per month? Who keeps HIT accountable if they are deemed to have acted in gross misuse of power or position? Where does the funding for HIT come from? And along with that, um, what is the operating budget for HIT in general? What is the breakdown of how much it costs per encampment cleanup? Because it seems like it's more expensive to do encampment cleanups and continue this service of HIT than it is to just provide actual services. Um, and given the costs by encampment cleanups, how does the city determine that encampment cleanups are providing solutions to houselessness at a reasonable and financial cost? Why is there a new position um, for these like specific fields? Um, and then also the statistics for the quality of life for law code enforcement are disorderly conduct, vagrancy, and loitering. Uh, have you guys ever discussed alternatives to HIT, such as like effective alternatives, ha alternatives? Like has there ever been conversation about what harm reduction services are, such as um, safe injection sites, Narcan distribution, things of that nature. What is the current status of shelter beds in acquiring shelters and how many empty homes are there in Fairfield or moms for home programs? Um, the HIT team just seems to be proven ineffective. I don't get why we're allocating this time to policing when we could do actual, when we could provide actual service to the house, um, houseless folks. These people policing should not be the people that we go to to deal with these specific issues. It seems completely completely ineffective and we brought this up several times and so it's time that we start bringing up specific data and showing like is this actually helpful because at this point like why not just have a homeless service vision or a homeless service actual positions where we have actual social workers and people trained in these specific fields rather than just investing and continually throwing money at police to deal with our problems it just makes no sense and it seems extremely ineffective and that's what I had to say. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have Crystal. Hello. Um, thanks for answering the call. Um, I would just like to bring up the evidence facility you guys approved last meeting, um, I believe. When encampment cleanups happen, they tell the people that they hold their things for 90 days. We have yet to see this happen or yet to see this facility, so we would really like to uh, reclaim people's property and get their tents and everything back to them since that's what the cops uh, steal from them. Um, I would just also like to address that cleanups are happening right now and they shouldn't be happening during COVID. Um, if beautification is a problem, then I suggest adding trash cans in restrooms. Um, and if you can't provide housing for people, then appoint a place where they can go and cops won't terrorize them. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. All right, next up we have Sid. Go ahead, Sid. Um, hi, so the, you admitted that the community doesn't trust you, yet you throw around the word mutual aid. And I thought I should help you define it a little bit. Um, mutual aid is support from the community directly to the community. And the mutual aid, that, mutual aid that you are hardly accomplishing is clearly shown to be ineffective. Um, the police throwing away the houseless community's belongings during a storm and freezing temperatures is not only inhumane, but also a waste of time and money. And uh, we will continue to alert the community of your actions until you halt them because it's unacceptable. Um, and I know that living a luxurious life means that you don't have to care about people that are not, but I suggest you do, because if you want the community's trust back, this is where you start. 
um, it really should be you guys focusing from the bottom up, not the top down. And um, until that's done, we're going to continue to alert the community of your actions. So I suggest you actually start to care about all community members and not just the ones you pick and choose. Thank you. All right, we have um, GM. Hi, um, I wanted to find out uh, the process for getting on the restorative justice um, committee that the captain had spoken about. She was saying that there was one that was modeled after Vacaville. And also I wanted to find out the jobs in terms of the positions for the crisis management team, were those advertised? And if so, where uh, were they advertised and how were people selected? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Cam Holzendorf. Um, let's see. Good morning, Mayor Price, council members. Um, Hope you guys are having a good day. Just have some concerns myself. I'm glad that I was able to speak at the public comment, although I was here at nine o'clock, but my hand got put down. But thank you either way for having the call. My thing is, I heard the, the word community relationships. Um, yes, it, um, not too long ago, I believe it was Wednesday, we had freezing inclement weathers and we had some community me uh, members that I say community members, you guys call them homeless people and probably think less of them, but community members out there freezing. And even one of these city council members made a, uh, a preeminent post about someone freezing to death. So insensitive right there. Um, but the biggest thing is community relationships with the hit team. I spied the hit team rolling through encampments with their cars, with sirens on, not giving them any information about the shelter. That's a problem. Why aren't the hit teams uh, stocked with flyers that tell them exactly where the shelter is? You can't just say city church and then expect the houseless person to understand. Then let me go ahead and get to the, uh, the, the, the communication to the houseless folk. We did not, and I checked all you guys' social medias, no one of you guys did share city church's message about how to get them to the, uh, to the shelter. That's a problem. How are they supposed to go ahead and get that information if us as leaders aren't even sharing that information? Um, we also have a problem with, um, where was it? Uh, sorry, uh, a place for them to go, all right? Other than just one shelter, I know we had multiple shelters back in the day. Gosh, I don't know what happened to them, but one safe shelter isn't enough. When we had fire dangers over in the summertime, we mobilized, we had four uh, 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 cooling shelters. Why couldn't we do the same thing? I propose that we open the police activist league up since the city is giving so much money to the police. Let's open up that, sh um, that gymnasium to go ahead and make us warming shelter. Um, and also city church, we need to, again, if we are going to label them as the shelter and you guys are going to put your name on them, I appreciate that you, if you guys actually shared it and then actually followed through and be it out there at City Church. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have, I think it's pronounced Emmy, M? Yes, it's pronounced Emmy. Um, good morning, City Council members. Um, I have a few issues. Um, one of them would be definitely with this, how the City Council handles houselessness. Um, like Cam and like others were saying, um, we had freezing weather and city council did nothing. Catherine Moy specifically made a post. I feel, I believe what I feel is a guilt post because she knows that she can do way more and city council knows that they can do way more for houseless people, but they don't, they choose not to. They choose to let people die in the streets. They choose to post about it when they're dead afterwards saying, oh my God, God forgive us, God help me. But of course, you do need God to forgive you because you could have done something about that. Another issue that I have is that Catherine Moy has been using her social media extremely, extremely inappropriately. And she's also been talking extremely inappropriately. Also, also Catherine Moy, I have a question for you. What makes you think that it's okay to show people and to tell people where somebody lit, where somebody works? 
it's giving people and other people a chance to target them. And I feel like that's extremely inappropriate. You are a grown woman and I feel like you need to handle your situation better. And also city council, I do not like how the way that you treat the community members when they are talking about things that they're passionate about and the about things that you need to be held accountable for. You need to be held accountable and you need to learn how to listen to community members' voices and you need to learn how to not see people who are telling you what to do as a threat, but as to be like, oh, okay, shit, I need to change. Um, it's very inappropriate. It's very stupid. You want a community, but you are also suppressing marginalized folks' voices. It just, it's really dumb. You just really need to care about people other than yourselves and other than privileged people. You need to care about marginalized people. You need to care about black people. You need to care about people who are fear for, fear for their lives from police. You need to care about houselessness. Just care about someone other than yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next we have Jillian. Hi. It's Jillian. Um, so going off of what everyone else has been saying, I wanted to speak on the encampment cleanups um, and how they're a waste of taxpayer dollars because it's just forcing the houseless to move around the city and you're not offering them really any solutions. Um, you're kind of basically treating them like dirt and sweeping them under the rug. Um, so I would like to know um, why we're having the cleanups, especially during COVID-19, um, when the CDC guidelines actually recommend that camping cleanups um, do not happen and allowing for the unsheltered to remain where they are because the encampment clearings can actually cause people to disperse throughout the community and then break connections with service providers and also spread, um, potentially spread the infectious diseases. Um, I'd also like to know what is the rationale and purpose behind encampment cleanups and who or what do these encampment cleanups serve? Um, and then, yes, I agree that the um, belongings of the houses should be stored for the 90 days that the police are saying they are. But however, whenever we try to help the houses claim, um, reclaim their belongings, um, for some reason, it's not available. Um, and then we also noticed that City Church had a shelter open um, for the storm and the cold weather that we had. However, we as a city and as a state knew about the oncoming storm and cold weather for at least over a week. And yet this one shelter was set up at the last minute, like the day after somebody had already died from the cold. So I feel like um, city council needs to be um, come, be more productive and come up with mm -hmm. more solutions instead of being very reactionary um, and yeah, care about their people and the houseless. Um, yes, yeah, so I would also like to know if Fairfield will be declaring a local emergency because of the oncoming cold and winter. And then um, what are the city outreaches efforts looking like right now? Like, are there plans to increase the utilization of other warming centers at City Church? Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have, and I don't wanna butcher this, Else, Elise? Yes. Hi, I would like to hear a response from any city council member from this. Uh, so in Austin, the city council shrunk the police budget and is diverting the money to buying hotels to house the houseless. One of my questions is why are encampment cleanups being performed when the warming centers are not open throughout the day as well? And I'll give you guys a moment to respond. City council can't comment on public comments. My other question is, will Fairfield be declaring a local emergency? Will Fairfield Council members work on opening warming centers as soon as possible and not relying on one church? And if not, what are the justi justifications for council members to not prioritize this? Lastly, what is the city's outreach efforts looking like right now? Are these 
are there plans to increase the utilization of the current warming center at City Church? And are there plans for any long-term solutions? There has been 62 evictions from March to December in Solana County. Does the city have any plans to support houseless or struggling peoples to secure long-term housing at reasonable rates, especially in the times of a pandemic? And when was the last time houseless folks spoke at city council? I feel like this should be a priority and why is it not being done more often when the council speaks on houselessness? Is there a plan for mutual aid in allowing houseless folks to build power and momentum for themselves? And I hope, no, I expect city council members to address some of these questions that I and other community members have brought up today and will continue to bring up tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, um, I have Sid on here again. Greg, what's the rule for people speaking twice? No, uh, there's oh, speakers only have a chance to speak once. Uh, we uh, there's not an opportunity to speak multiple times. Okay, are there any more speakers before we close the um, public speaking session? Okay. All right, none except Sid, who's already spoke, so um, we can move forward. Mr. City Manager, your introduction, please. Yes, our next up would be uh, uh, fire, so fire department's up. Tony? Mr. Mr. Mayor, it's Pam Bertani. Can I just make a quick comment before we move forward? Okay, please. Thank you. Mr. City Manager, the, the question is for you, so I, I just want to know if we're going to be engaging in a much more in-depth conversation about homelessness and our strategies um, here in Fairfield. Um, and I'd like to know when, because I don't disagree with many of the comments that were stated. I think that our response um, ha uh, has been you know, less than optimal. Um, I think that um, Shelter Solano is underperforming in all these times. And I think that we really need to step up to the plate and look at what we're going to be doing differently as we move forward. And I just wanna make sure that we're gonna be discussing that in detail, um, flesh it out in a manner that does not require us to rush, but allows us to really peel the layers back and look at exactly what we're doing? And the answer is yes. Um, your, your schedule for today and tomorrow, as I said, is pushing a lot of information quickly to you on the different departments. Then beginning with the February 8th meeting, at the end of tomorrow's meeting, we ask that the council give some direction to the staff of what you would like first in those, uh, in those discussion sessions. The first of which is February 8th. That was your first available uh, time for the, for the group. And if the council so chooses to make that one exclusively on homelessness, then that's, uh, then that's what we'll do. But that will be the decision of the city council on when you want to schedule those next things to discuss um, uh, more detail on, on your directives, on your visions, on your priorities for this coming year, so. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, next is uh, fire, and that will be uh, Chief Velasquez. Welcome, Chief. Good morning, Mayor. Members of the council, your fire chief, Tony Velasquez. Very excited to uh, be here. Great to see every one of you. I really missed seeing all of you at all the events, the parades this past year, but uh, what we uh, had happened last year and we're still going through, I, we're going to be stronger and and the best part of this job, and like all of you, is just being out in the community. And I look forward to getting back out there with all of you and seeing you out in the community. So with that being said, it's just my pleasure once again to be here before you. Uh, this is number eight for me. Uh, definitely always excited to get uh, to the workshop every year, get some good planning done, set some uh, good goals for the upcoming year. And, and all of us, I think we're all starting to really see the hard work pay off. And I, and I really can say that throughout the whole city, all the departments, the whole organization. And the fire department really this past year, I'd have to say the last 12 months, we 
we really did with all the challenges set a solid foundation, what I see for all our future initiatives. So with that being said, yes, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, and of course my, uh, <laughs> it was working just a minute ago. Looks like it froze, so let me back off just a second. Okay, back out, stop share. So what should I do? So go back to share screen again. Share screen. And click on... This one? Yes. Share. And now... Um, click the button. And Tony, just to warn you, we can't see you, but we can hear you. So don't say anything bad right now. There you go. All right, looks like we got it back. We're good? Got the thumbs up, okay. So yeah, so I wanna go ahead and just present the org chart. Uh, I've had a few changes uh, since last time I was before you, but we continue to have our two sections and our six divisions. Uh, the operations section is led by our Deputy Chief, Matt Lukenbach, which is also responsible for our emergency response division. Our prevention bureau, which is led by our Fire Marshal, Stephen Conti. Our administration division is led by our senior analyst, Taylor Armour. And then our support section is led by our deputy chief, John Sturdy, who is responsible for our training division, our EMS division, and our newly created emergency management division. And it locked up again. Hmm. Well, stand by. If necessary, as a backup, I can pull it up on my screen and share it and go through the slides. If we need to do that, just let me know. Let me try this one more time, Amber, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can go with that. Okay.
Hey, Amber. Yep. Why don't you go ahead and uh, you're going to have to control it because it's not working for me. Okay, go ahead and stop sharing. Tony, we're going to test your ability to uh, to be flexible during a crisis emergency. Yeah, no. <laughs> All that practice. We're going to see how good you are at being a firefighter right now. Okay. No, we're good. Okay. So yeah, so let's, uh, there we go. So yeah, thank you, Amber. And we'll just kind of, I'll just have to go with the next slide comment then. Okay, so yeah, so we have our emergency response division and this is uh, basically our five fire stations uh, running out of the city right now. We currently run approximately 14,000 calls. Uh, on a daily basis, we're running about an average of 40 calls a day on our 911 uh, emergencies this year, this past 2020. We definitely saw an increase in uh, fire calls this year, up about 40% this past year. Next slide, Amber. So now we have our administration division. This is where we do all of our recruiting, hiring takes place, our budget development, uh, all of our wonderful grant writing and cost recovery we do with FEMA. We've gotten some great news this past year with FEMA. We went from 75%. We're looking on some reimbursements up to 100%. And uh, the cost recovery has been great with grants also. Uh, through our uh, Bieri Wasi, and just for training and equipment, and all of that is all done in our administration building. Next slide, please. So training, yes, training is taking place over in our training tower over on Union Avenue, which is where our training chief is. Uh, training chief Nick Eisen is at. Uh, we have a lot of great things happening there. Even through the pandemic, we were able to get our training and meet all our training standards. Uh, one of the exciting things that happened. Uh, this past year, we were with the assistance of our city attorney and everything was we were now in having the ability to offer rental agreements. And we have some of the cities, the Solano College, are now utilizing our training tower, which is very exciting for us. Uh, next one, please. EMS continues to be 70% of what our call volume is. And we have uh, definitely, as far as our uh, public-private partnership, with medic ambulance, we continue to barely, but we do meet our 90% of our EMS calls are met within seven minutes. Uh, really happy and proud of that. The other thing I'm happy to report is now every firefighter chief officer in the fire department is now we are 100% paramedic, uh, advanced life support. So that is something uh, we had not been, but this that past year we are now 100% paramedic now. Next slide, please. So fire prevention. So yes, the addition of our new, uh, Fire Marshal Stephen Conti, that was a big help for us. And it really helped us as far as establishing the division. We know we did that uh, this, this uh, a few years back, but I think it's really allowed us to go to the next level. And he's really done that. And it's allowed us to free up that, that other division, which is the, uh, the emergency um, management division. And by having our new fire marshal with our three over 3,000 building inspections that we have to do. And we weren't able to get into all of them this year, obviously for a lot were closed, but we were able to reach out and obviously just kind of help in any way we can during the pandemic with our fire prevention inspectors. We had some great uh, projects this past year. Our Knoxbox project uh, roughly uh, got the Cadillac. All our businesses now are all completed with our Knoxbox program, which we're very happy to report. Our false alarm billing, as far as we are down significantly because of this new billing and, and, and the procedure we do now, and we're happy to report, and that's just truly by the dedicated men and women in our prevention division. Next, please. So our, this is our new division. So as you can imagine, this, this past year, but we have really been active in this division, and it's been a great success, not only within us as the fire department taking the lead, but more importantly, within this division, with our help from our HR and all the departments, uh, we just all of our uh, city employees completed all of their EOC training this past year, 100%. Um, that was very exciting because as all of you know, every city employee is a disaster worker and everybody is willing to meet the uh, call as far as coming over here. And if it's in any role that they can play, we are now at least have the basic minimum uh, training for our emergency operations center here at the fire administration on Kentucky and Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So yeah, so the capital improvements. So station 36 definitely tends to be 
uh, the, the big priority right now. And that's the, the fire station you can see on that map there out in the Green Valley area. I, and, and as you can see, that, that um, is, is in the works. It's off of Business Center Drive. And we moved out there in 1994. And that's the last time we have added a fire station. We were running approximately 4,000 calls back in 1994. And now we're running 14,000 calls. So this will be our first added station. Um, on, uh, almost going to be 30 years by the time we get completed with this. Uh, the next station is Fire Station 39. That's our fire station that's on Huntington Court off of Walters. Uh, this one was built in the 70s. Uh, it, it's definitely outdated, and we are in uh, the talks of obviously relocating, which is going to give us a better response time, and I look forward to coming before you later this year. And to talk about that with our great people in Public Works, Paul Koschel, Ryan Paganeben, there's a lot of great work happening as we look to relocate and move out of this station. So we're looking forward to it. And the location is going to be ideal for us for what we look at the growth that's going to be happening um, out off of Peabody when the train station development. The next one you see is station 40. That's, that's the fire station off of Vista Grande and Hillborn. And as you can tell by that fire engine in there, and that's one of our older ones, uh, we're, the new ones that we are getting, it, it's definitely getting more difficult. That's the house looking station. Uh, we're going to have to do some rehab over the next few years, and we're going to have to do some things and additions. And once again, working with our, our uh, fine folks over at Public Works, and we're going to look at ways to, and it's a great location for what we need to do for response times. But we do need to look at, because we did look elsewhere, but that is a great location. We have a lot of land there, and we think we can do a, a great job by a phased in approach and making that station a little bit bigger. And lastly, just as far as some improvements, just our fleet. And, and one of the very great things, decisions we made a while back was the, the fleet maintenance facility, combining police and fire, and more importantly, having Public Works take it over with their professional staff. Dave Rentschler, Sean Christensen are, are excellent as, at what they do, and it's truly been a, a great partnership that we share over there at the maintenance facility, and they're very efficient, and there's things that we've learned that, we, you know, as far as replacements and timelines, and so we, we have a first-class fleet operation and maintenance facility over there, and that's some of the things that that's part of that is, you know, when repairs are happening, and we, we, we can't always just repair it. We, we have to always look um, um, as far as the cost of the repair versus the replacement. So uh, that was as another challenge we're going to have over the next year. Next, please. So yeah, so cost recovery. So we have some, some big things happening. We just brought to you last council meeting, the public-private partnership. And that, that truly was a major accomplishment for us. And that's our partnership with Medic Ambulance. And it's also uh, done with uh, three other cities, Vallejo, Benicia Dixon, and I'm happy to report Susun City now has joined as part of that partnership. We took the lead. Our city attorney was absolutely just um, outstanding helping us through this. Uh, the, we definitely took the lead. It was about a two and a half year process, um, but you, you can see as from the last council uh, meeting, we, we have an increase for, of approximately $950,000 is what's coming in now. And what that is, is just basically medic ambulance buying time from us. I told you we have seven minute response times. They have 12. Uh, we look very much forward to another great opportunity in 2025. That's when the contract um, is up for the transport. And we look to um, also be at the forefront of this and really look at opportunity as far as if, it, if it's with medic ambulance, the same thing, but it's also putting money back in the system. And the money that we need to put back in the system, obviously, a big piece of that is response times and getting to the calls that we need to get to. Prevention vegetation management, everything's going strong there as well. Uh, we are definitely uh, capturing our fees, getting uh, the money that we need through grants. Uh, vegetation management is, is really a big part now. Um, as you can, I'll talk about that at the end, but it's becoming a big part of what we do. What we used to do seasonally is now uh, something that we do, we're really looking at full time. Lastly is our safer grant, and that's that's staffing uh, for adequate fire and emergency response. Uh, this past year, we were not successful in getting the grant. This is what we look at, and, and I'm happy to report again that it's 100% no match for three years. And this is what we're looking at to kind of bridge the gap for the staffing that we need for that fire station out in the Green Valley area that I talked about out at Station 36. So we're looking forward to a new strategy. We are already working on it. And we will be before you for a letter of commitments because the, uh, pro the application process has opened and we'll be bringing it to you that in March. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the emergency plan. So this this is something also exciting to share with you. We, we definitely have been tested this past year. And you can see from the slide, uh, multiple events that have happened this past year. And with the emergency plan that hasn't been updated since 2008, uh, we have now uh, brought on a, a, a somebody to, to write this for us. And, and we hope to be in front of you sometime in the fall with our emergency plan. And we're gonna have the updates and we have representatives from all of the departments that are gonna be a part of this process. And everybody, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, of time and, and spent from all the other departments and, and it crosses all of them, public works, police, community development, building department, parks and rec. So everybody's really included in this. So we're looking forward to this emergency plan. And like I said, we hope to bring this to you sometime in the fall. Uh, next, please. So yeah, this, this plan right, right here, this, this, I'm sorry, the map shows you our current fire stations. And you can see just to give you the geography, station 39, that's the one that I talked about on Huntington and Walter, Station 41, that's North Texas. That's the one up by Raley's. Uh, station 40 is the Hillborn Vista Grande. Station 37, that's our fire station right here, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. And Station 35 is the one over by Lopes across the street from Rodriguez High School. And as you can see, Station 36 uh, is, is uh, the one that we're talking about that we brought before you a couple of years back. Um, there's, there's major, uh, um, Things happening at that site right now with the apartment complex. The big thing that this, this map also can show you is uh, you can now see with station 36, which is, is, is exciting to us, we now will have two fire stations on the west side of I-80. So that, that's big for us. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so the number of stations, like I said, is, is really just is, is a big deal that for us adding that sixth station, but also one, one other thing that we're really uh, looking forward to uh, is the general plan. The general plan hasn't been updated since 1994 and the standards that we have in there uh, do not met, match from 1994 to what we currently have um, today. And as you can see, based on that previous map, how spread out we are, um, it's really difficult um, based on response times. And response times are so critical when you start thinking about just, just really quickly cardiac arrest and you start thinking the different phases of fire and trying to get people out and also safety of the firefighters. Uh, so yeah, definitely with um, the, the general plan update, we're looking forward to that. Um, we do see we're a very busy, <laughs> we're, we're, for our size, we are a very busy fire department. And we think that we're gonna also see some things that are gonna help us for the future planning for what our needs are going to be. The next thing I just really wanna touch on is the big change that we've had. And some of you uh, may have seen some of the challenges with our fire districts. I know our mayor is on the uh, LAFCO board. And uh, the way that these districts are set up for mutual aid and the way that um, we, we can no longer, as we look at the mutual aid we receive on a daily basis from the other districts and cities, we can't rely on the, the volunteer was, was good uh, concept. But now as we, we move into these bigger cities and the challenges we face now, it's not sustainable. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge for us to meet all the training standards, the equipment, uh, the physical, mental health and wellness of our firefighters on a day to day that we have to. And these districts, the one thing I will say, and I've worked with some of the county supervisors with the task force, and I'm looking forward to working with them as you're continuing to read some of the things from this, this past year on that fire. Um, I will say this, I'm excited that the right questions are being asked. And we got a group, it's gonna take time, but like I said, we're gonna make progress. But like I said, the reliance on the fire districts out there is not sustainable anymore. And we're gonna move forward with like services. Um, and, and when I talk about like services, I'm, I'm definitely talking about the city department's paramedic services. What we provide to other cities, we want in return. And that's something, like I said, we do on a daily basis where we obviously we accept, but we also provide. And then lastly, I just really want to just say about vegetation management. That's there's a lot going on here within our state. Uh, we saw a lot of our firefighters this past year um, go out throughout the state. Not only are they, we had some in our county, but we did um, obviously send firefighters to help out uh, mutual aid throughout the state. Just remember that money is all reimbursed, and we always have our. We never, as far as the staffing back here, we always have our minimum staffing when we send those people out or we don't send them. You know, the prior priority is the city of Fairfield. So I need to make sure that's clear.
But yeah, vegetation management, I think there's some great things happening, but this is no longer something that we do on a seasonal basis. We had a very huge success this past year with the, the fire from the LNU when it jumped the freeway to the Paradise. When it jumped the freeway and it, it started to approach our Paradise uh, Valley neighborhood, uh, we had some things that were done ahead of time, pre-planning, lines were put in. Um, this was all done based on vegetation management and some of the great work that we did, our public works folks did, and it, it really did stop the fire with the great firefighter tactics, but also some pre, uh, pre-planning and preventative measures we took. And that's where vegetation management is key. And I think that to us is going to become year round. We got to talk to our folks at Caltrans. Uh, we have a lot of freeway we cover, and that's we often see where a lot of these fires still continue to start. But this is something that, like I said, that is going to be high on our list this upcoming year. And we look forward and excited to making it happen. So I, I, with that being said, I apologize for the the, the PowerPoint, but thank you, Amber. Um, I, I think I'm at the question point um, now in my presentation. Um, and then, yeah, I, I did have some closing comments, Mayor, but I'm, I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions. No question, that's good. Uh, I'm here. Okay. Um, hi, Chief, it's Kat. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for a really good presentation. And um, we don't expect our expert firefighters to be good on computers. So you're going to be okay with that. Um, <clears throat> our call volume concerns me. I think we've been short of firefighters and police um, for at least six years, longer actually. Um, we have about the same police officers or, or fewer than we did in 2009. And uh, we can't grow like this without adding. So that's on us. Um, I like that you're looking at um, funding, but we can't rely on that to keep our firefighters working. And um, I am concerned and have been for quite a long time about the amount of mutual aid. Um, we are, uh, I know we receive it, but that we're giving. Um, especially in Susun City and um, some of the fire district areas. Um, I know about a lot of those calls. Do you have any idea how, how many calls we get from mutual aid annually? Um, you know, it, it's definitely, I will have the annual report out next month. So okay. you will definitely have those numbers for you. Um, it, it's, you know, it, the, the last, it's, it's, only, it's only about the roughly, it, it's a few hundred calls a year. It's, it's not as many as you would think. Um, yeah. Considering with the freeways, that's, that's a big part of our mutual aid, the freeway, because right. you look at that freeway, how divided it is and where, where one city stops and one. And sometimes when you get the calls, you don't realize it. Um, when you say Susun, I will say that uh, Susun has made some big, as far as strides in their fire service. They, they are definitely... Yes, yeah, they're, they're uh, very, very proud and happy. And they ask um, a lot of questions of us. And we, we definitely, we want to help them in every way we can. But it's nice to see, um, I mentioned in the public-private partnership, they now have joined, they have paramedic services um, in, in uh, Susun. But when we send these folks, like we have some folks down south right now working in the hospitals. Yes. And I just need, you know, I want to re reiterate that we, we continue to have the staffing here. Um, now, I understand the concern about, obviously, burnout and, and the firefighter mental health and wellness, and I get that, and we are very strong um, on, on the things that we've learned and the things, the approaches we've had, and, and to be honest with you, I, I, I always thank the police department because um, they were always leaders in this as far as um, talking about peer support and things like that, so we, um, we are definitely, I feel now, we're, we're right there with them, but uh, but, but, you know, as far as mutual aid goes, um, yeah, I mean, it's something that um, we cannot staff. We can't staff for these, these big emergencies. That's, that's just not um, something uh, that's, that's feasible. But I think California is the leader in mutual aid and, and the system and we have in place and the relationships we have um, is, is just outstanding. So. Yes, I, I think so too. And I'm, also happy with Susan City. I don't know if they can hold on to it. Yeah. Um, to be frank, their finances are um, not good. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much, uh, 
Chief, thank you for everything. I, I love how you always go out and you guys are looking for money, getting those grants and just doing just great work here in the city and beyond. So thank you. Any other comments, colleagues? I have a question. Councilman Tonneson. Yes. Hey, Chief, how are you doing? Hey, Councilman Tonneson. <laughs> I got a Councilman Tonneson. Good to see you. Sir. Good to see you, Tom. Hey, um, can you can you expand a little bit on the, you, you mentioned the volunteers and I kind of, we still have volunteers at Fairfield, correct? Or are you, are you not going to use volunteers from the surrounding so, so we have reserve firefighters. We really want to, we've been away from the volunteer in the firefighter capacity. We still have some volunteers like our CERT team that, that helps support us. But the, as far as the standards, the training requirements, the equipment there, it's not, we can't, it's not like we, we, we can't, they have to have the same amount of equipment training that we have. Uh, the background checks, we, we have to treat them like a full-time firefighter. And that's why we went to the reserve program. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult. The days I know when you had every, the bell would ring and, and everybody would come running down to the firehouse. And yeah, I, I just, I think the demands that we have and the education and everything that the fire service has taken on, which we, we like, but the things that you think about that I'm doing today that I wasn't doing when I started 30 years ago, when I started in the fire service. So yeah, I, I mean, it, and, and you're seeing it in these districts where it's very difficult right now, believe it or not, to hire career firefighters. Um, it's, it's very, I mean, it, it's very difficult right now. And then on top of that, trying to hire volunteers. I, th I think that's where I was going with the reserves. I just wanted to make sure that that was still in place. Yes, sir. Um, and the, the, the PP, PPP with medic, could you expand on that a little bit? It's, it's, it, it has to do with time. Yeah. So, so, bas time? so basically what it is, is I talk about that seven minutes we have seven minutes to get to 90% of our calls, EMS calls. And what that allows uh, is medic to go to 12 minutes, 90% uh, of the time. So that means they don't have to staff as many ambulances because we can get there quicker. And you think about what now medic in the rural areas where they're not part of the agreement, they have to be there within nine minutes. So they have to be there, they have to staff object, obviously strategically throughout the, the county and the city. But that allows them, like I said, um, and plus we have, like I said, 100% paramedics. So we're able to get done exactly what needs to get done. And obviously in, when somebody uh, has an emergency. Okay, that clears it up. And uh, 37, 37 still, still the busiest, busiest by, by far? far? Definitely the busiest in the county. It's still the busiest uh -huh. in the county. Yes, the one okay. here on uh, Kentucky and Pennsylvania. Yes, sir. Thanks, Chief. Councilwoman Panduro, please. Hi, Chief. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I had a question. This The term mutual aid has come up the last two presentations. I just want to make sure that I understand what that means. If you can explain what that means on the fire end. Yeah. No, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically, like I said, the state, we have it, but it's friends helping friends. I mean, that's what it is. And, and I talk about we cannot staff for the big fires, the big emergencies on a daily basis. We just, that's not sustainable. It's not feasible. So what we rely on is a very aggressive mutual aid system. And the fire service is definitely something that has, has, has adopted this and um, we've mastered it. Um, we have the ability to go and run calls in Vacaville, Baleo, uh, mm -hmm. Susum, Benicia, because like I said, once again, you get certain calls we cannot staff every day for those those major wildland incidents. So that's you know what definitely comes to mind. Um, you might have a major vehicle accident, or, which requires uh, an, a multi, an MCI mass casualty incident. So that's why it's really critical that I you know I, I uh, meet uh, very regularly with the fire chiefs, and we have it's all through the ranks, and that's where it's just um, back to like I said, mutual aid. And the fire service is a little bit unique uh, from some of the other uh, discussions you heard earlier. But like I said, it really just comes down to, you know, we have these significant incidents that yes, we do the best we can with our staffing that we have, but we cannot staff every day for the major incidents that we uh, have to respond to. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Good scene. And Chief, I'd like to thank you for your leadership in consolidating the fire districts. The volunteer districts just could not perform to the standards that you have laid out so clearly for us here in the city of Fairfield. And that was part of the reason that 
LAFCO was able to take the aggressive action that was necessary. So thank you very much. And thank you for this presentation today. Colleagues, yeah. any, any other comments, please? Yeah, real, Mayor. Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, just real quick a comment. Uh, first of all, Chief, I know we've said this before in the August meeting, but just, you know, to thank you guys so much for what you did this summer. You know, I mean, it was incredible the fact that there were no structures, you know, in the city itself uh, burned. But also, I know this year is probably going to be another year you're looking at talking to other people in fire departments, other fire departments. You know, they don't expect these fires to just go away. And I know you're, uh, you and I have talked about the preparation that you guys are going to have for this summer again. So um, I just wanted to thank you guys for all you do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Chief, for your presentation. Turn it yeah. back to you, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Next, uh, next oh. we have up uh, pub, uh, Paul Cashall with our Public Works Department. Okay, yeah. Councilman Tim, you wanted to make a comment before we leave? No. Okay. No, Mayor. I was just uh, waving goodbye to the Chief. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Mr. City Manager, please. So we've got Paul up. Paul, it's all yours, buddy. Good morning. Good morning, Paul. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Let's see if this works for me. And Paul's wearing a suit. I want everybody to take note of that right now <laughs> on a Friday. How's that? Do you see that? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Let's see if it holds up. Well, good morning again, everyone, Mr. Mayor and Council, Paul Koshel, your Public Works Director. Uh, happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of information about Public Works. So Public Works is responsible for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of our public infrastructure. And to accomplish that, we're organized into five divisions and I'll go through each division here um, over the next few slides. Our engineering division delivers our capital improvement program or CIP. And the CIP includes and delivers large infrastructure projects. Our current five year CIP includes about 80 construction projects totaling close to $200 million in value. Other major responsibilities include private development review and traffic engineering. And our inspections team ensures that our public infrastructure uh, is constructed according to our city standards. Our utilities division staff operates our two state-of-the-art water treatment plants, Waterman and North Bay Regional, or NBR. These two plants treat water for the entire city, which amounts to an average daily demand of about 20 million gallons per day. From both a water supply and water treatment capacity standpoint, we're in a very strong position and able to continue to serve the additional demand of residential, commercial, and industrial growth for years to come. Utilities also oversees and manages the city's solid waste and recycling program, including our franchise agreement with Republic Services. Transportation division operates as Fairfield and Sassoon Transit, or FAST. And in partnership with MB Transportation, FAST staff manages the operation and planning of our bus service. FAST uh, operates local fixed routes in Fairfield and Sassoon City, regional bus service called Solano Express, which provides a convenient option to commuters traveling up to as far as Sacramento um, or down into the Bay Area, and then paratransit service for eligible residents with disabilities. Staff also administers a subsidized local taxi service program. The fleet management division <clears throat> is responsible for vehicle maintenance, procurement, and parts purchasing for the entire city fleet. This includes our buses and our public works fleet. And as Chief Velasco has mentioned earlier, we also maintain all fire and police vehicles. In 2020, our fleet staff completed more than 7,000 preventative maintenance and repair worker orders on our fleet. And last but not least is operations. Uh, ops is further organized into four divisions. Streets includes the maintenance of pavement, traffic signals, signage, and street lights. The water division operates our water distribution and sewer collection system networks. 
landscape. Uh, maintenance includes trees, roadside landscaping, parks, and our heart team that addresses illegal dumping and debris cleanup. Building maintenance is responsible for our public buildings, including civic center complex, as well as our fire stations. Okay, so switching gears, I'll spend the remainder of my time highlighting three uh, departmental challenges along with the initiatives that we're undertaking to, uh, to try to address them. And first off is aging infrastructure, which for a city, Fairfield's age, uh, will continue to be an ongoing challenge for us. There's just a lot to maintain um, and not enough funding to do it all. So we are constantly working to prioritize and find the best ways to stretch and leverage the resources that we have available. In recent years, we've placed additional priority um, with, with council's direction towards our pavement, water distribution, sewer collection networks. Um, and this year and over the next few years, our public buildings require additional attention. So all buildings have a lifespan uh, or an expected service life. And the lifespans vary depending on uh, the use or type of construction. Many of Fairfield's public buildings, those constructed uh, now uh, ar around 1970 are now about 50 years old. And 50 years is, is used by some building and facility managers as an average lifespan, at least for planning and budgeting purposes. That doesn't mean we expect to demolish or rebuild all of our public buildings every 50 years, but we can expect that major building system components will need to be replaced or modernized. In some cases, the building no longer meets the needs of the community. And so either replacement or major rehabilitation is required. Station 39 is a prime example. Chief Alaska has touched on it a little bit earlier. <clears throat> Station 39 is about 45 years old and it no longer meets the needs of the fire department and the community. So we do plan to build a, a replacement fire station which will be able to accommodate two crews, two fire crews um, so that the fire department can adequately serve the additional growth anticipated in Northeast Fairfield. Here's a few more projects. It's just a partial listing of some of the major public building um, projects uh, and facilities that we hope to address over the next few years. Um, we talked about uh, 39 and Chief Alaska has also talked about the, the new station 36 out in Green Valley, North Cordelia area at our corporate public works corporation yard. So we're in the planning phases now um, for an extensive electrical infrastructure upgrade. And that's in order to comply with state regulations to transition to a zero emission or battery electric fleet. And that would be both for, both for buses and for the public works fleet. And at the civic center uh, complex, we have a few major projects, um, including the modernization of our central utility plant, which provides power and heat for, for the entire complex. <clears throat> Chief Cantrell talked about the needs in the police department um, and the expansion of that building in order to bring um, you know, the staffing there um, back under uh, one building. And then we need to start the planning for uh, the replacement or upgrades to the city's primary data center. So these, these projects, facility projects are expensive. Um, and, and so over the next few months, we will be working to establish the priority, the phasing and the funding strategy to move them forward. Uh, then the projects will be uh, updated into our capital improvement program, our CIP, and then incorporated into the upcoming two-year budget for your consideration. We'll then be able to advance in the planning and design phases. So the next challenge I wanted to highlight uh, is related to solid waste and recycling. Senate Bill 1383, it was signed into law in 2016 and it was formally adopted by CalRecycle um, in November, 2020. And it's established methane emissions reduction targets um, in a statewide effort to reduce emissions of short-lived climate pollutants. And the goals of 1383 are to combat climate change and also combat food insecurity in California. SB 1383 is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in California in the past 30 years. It requires the state to reduce organic waste by 75% in, by 2025 and increase edible food recovery by 20% by 2030. 
by 2025. Those regulations are set to go into effect January 1st, 2022. So the city and uh, our solid waste consultant, R3 Consulting Group, have created a legislative compliance plan to ensure that the city's current and ongoing solid waste program is compliant with Cal Recycle and the legislative requirements. A lot of work still needs to be done and, and SB 1383 will, will impact numerous departments uh, in addition to public works, of course, the finance department and city manager's office. <clears throat> uh, local jurisdictions like the city will, will bear the brunt of the work um, to implement this and will be required to um, implement an edible food recovery plan, enforcement plan and conduct um, significant public education and outreach to residences and businesses. So Republic Services, they, they have an exclu exclusive franchise agreement with the city uh, for solid waste, recyclables, and organic waste. The contract with Republic was signed in 2011. It was amended in 2016, and it's currently set to expire in November 2025. However, due to these um, increased legislative requirements and costs associated with implementing and managing um, Senate Bill 1383, it's likely Republic Services will request either a contract negotiation or an extension um, or rate increases. And so meetings with Republic uh, will occur um, here in these first two quarters of 2021. Um, and a new contract is going to be needed to be in place by January 2022 to coincide with those um, regulations. The city's also begun outreach to businesses and uh, that, that will need to subscribe to organic recycling. <clears throat> and as of December 2020, that includes 700 businesses that will need to be contacted and potentially be required to subscribe to organic recycling. Exemptions do exist, um, and the city is working with CalRecycle and businesses about postponing, especially in light of COVID-19 and economic impacts. Uh, the, city's, the city's solid waste consultant, R3, they'll help us uh, they'll lead us through a, an effort, a study session um, in, in early 2021. So we'll keep your prize of that. And, and that study session will, will focus in more detail, um, SB 1383. And we expect that, you know, may need to be like a half day type, uh, half day or full day potentially study session. The last item I wanted to bring to your attention is public transportation, which across the nation has been hit really hard by COVID-19. In the Bay Area, service was greatly reduced um, in late March as a result of shelter at home orders. Fares were eliminated to protect and lessen contact between passengers and drivers and consistent with other transit operators throughout the Bay Area region. Specifically for fast local service during the pandemic, ridership is down more than 80% and fare revenue has decreased 95%. And yet locally and throughout the region, transit services continue as an essential service, providing a lifeline to those that are transit dependent and to essential workers that use transit to commute to work. Uh, FAST is currently operating at 65% of pre-COVID levels. And thanks to the Coronavirus Relief Fund or CARES Act funding, we've been able to implement safety measures as you see here and bridge the funding gap from reduced fair revenues. But the re relief funding is temporary. So the big question in the transit world is, how do we plan for post COVID? And it, it's unknown how quickly public transportation will rebound from the pandemic. But most in the industry believe it will take multiple years for ridership to bounce back, especially with many companies indicating they will continue to allow telecommuting post COVID. Meetings and coordination among Bay Area operate, transit operators have been ongoing since the initial stay at home orders. And MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission has convened a Blue Ribbon Task Force, which, which is chaired by Solano County Supervisor Spearing uh, to develop a transit recovery strategy uh, for the Bay Area. And st FAST staff will stay plugged into that and we'll keep you informed of any major developments there. Locally, uh, Fairfield and Sassoon City have their own unique needs, transit needs. So in 2021, FAST will undergo, undergo a comprehensive operational analysis or COA 
to prepare for, for post-COVID service. A COA uh, will incorporate stakeholder input and uh, recommends innovative and cost-effective cost transit options that, that will help inform how we should prioritize limited transit funding over the next 10 years. Uh, our COA consultant, Innovate Mobility, will guide staff through the process, which will include seeking input from Fairfield and Sassoon city residents, stakeholders, and city council. And we anticipate uh, coming before council at key stages over the next several months to provide updates on the progress and seek your input. Throughout the process, one of the questions we will try to answer is, what are the core services transit should be providing to best serve our community? And I think with that, that's the end of my presentation and I'm available for your questions. I'm answer questions, colleagues. Mr. Vice Mayor, please. Yeah, hi, Paul. Uh, very good presentation. I don't know if you are the person to talk to. I know you and I have discussed the uh, skate park and the reason why um, it has been closed since September. I know I've gotten a few calls regarding that from, uh, from some of our young citizens. Uh, and I know April, I guess, is the timeline. So I don't know if you want to touch on that, why it's taking so long, because I know it's an outlet for a lot of our young people, especially during the time of the pandemic. Yes, sir. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so uh, Alan Witt um, renovation project. Uh, we're currently in uh, the first two phases, which includes both the skate park and the dog park. Um, originally, was the dog park phase was bid out first. Bids came in very high. Um, we at that time we decided um, since the design for the uh, dog park um, was uh, almost ready. We rejected those bids, packaged them together, hoping that we'd have some economy of scale um, when bidding those two phases together. That held true, um, and we got uh, better bids from packaging those two projects. Uh, so the contractor um, that's currently out there on site um, is doing both projects, both phases under one contract. And uh, that contract, um, uh, the schedule for that project, which started, uh, I believe, in September, um, the contract requirements and the schedule had that project continuing until uh, spring of 2021. We are currently on track. The, current, the contractor is on track um, per the contract requirements um, to finish up around the end of April, of course, weather permitting um, and allowing the work to continue. Uh, um, the safety uh, of park users is paramount for us. Um, the uh, when the construction commenced in September, the contractor secured that site um, and they're expected to secure that site for the duration of the construction, <clears throat> both for the safety of the users, but then also so they can um, you know, continue and complete the project um, on time. All right, thank you. Okay. Fair, uh, Tim, please. Yeah, Paul, what are, you talked about your CIP projects over the next five years. What are some of the bigger more expensive project, projects that are coming on the horizon? Where are they located in the city and, and what will it be? Just a quick overview. Yeah, so um, the, the building projects, facility projects, our public buildings, those are the big money um, projects. Uh, those are very expensive. And so that, that's why I wanted to highlight that as a challenge. Um, we do have, we are gonna be updating our paving plan. We're gonna have, you know, we, we do annual uh, an annual paving project each year. I don't know um, if, uh, that we've finalized and identified where those uh, the, the new paving projects are going to be in the upcoming years, but that, that'll be updated. Um, we are also working, not for this year, but we are working, um, as you know, with, with the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District staff um, to identify additional funding to upgrade our, um, our sewer, uh, sewer system. Um, and so that's probably, you know, it'll be incorporated into the CIP, but probably a couple of years out once we know what funding will be available. Um, and then we always have projects to uh, make sure our treatment plants are, are kept up in, you know, in tip top shape. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Moy, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Paul, you, you have so much, Public Works always has, and I think you guys are um, quiet heroes. I mean, you do so much 
in this city, all of the people who work for you. And it's, it's, it's amazing to me. I, I did have a couple of questions. What is edible food recovery? What does that mean? Yeah, and I'm not the expert on it, but my, my general understanding is there's a lot of food that's thrown away right? Whether that's from restaurants or grocery stores. And the, the idea and the goal is to recover, right? Before it's thrown away. Yeah. Um, because then once that food is thrown away and it decomposes, that creates emissions. And yeah. so, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that are, that, that are hungry, right? And that don't have the food that they need. And so how do you create a system, whether it's, you know, whether it's from restaurants or grocery stores, that have a surplus that are going to throw it away, but let's divert those and get it to the people who need it. I see. Well, you know, um, when I ran Heather House, the homeless shelter, we were able to get a lot of that food. Um, we had programs. And uh, so we ate a lot of what I guess we're calling edible food recovery. Um, we did a lot of that. And um, I know that other shelters, well, at least it existed at the time. I don't know anymore because um, they're pretty fat over there. But, um, you know, they uh, did the same. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then the other question that I had was, what's our fair recovery now? Oh, fair, from transit? Yes. Yeah. So the goal... Um, the goal is 20% fare box recovery. Yeah. Um, I don't have the number at my fingertips for what we're currently um, able to. I mean, we're basically our revenues currently are at, at you know down 95%. So it, right. it's, it's it's I mean close to zero, right? Um, right. But there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, one is for the safety of the the riders and and the drivers. Um, there was a decision you know during the early stages of, of the pandemic to eliminate fares. Um, and that was done throughout the region, right? Um, to, for, to encourage those that need it to still use transit. Um, but then also we had some CARES Act funding, um, stimulus funding to be able to bridge that gap. Okay. Um, but the goal, I think, for, from the, the federal, you know, from the FTA, from the, from the feds is 20%. And so we're always working towards that goal and working with, you know, our partners at MTC and with the STA to meet those requirements. And so that's the goal. The COA is going to help inform that. How do we get to that fare box recovery, that 20%? How do we change and kind of reimagine transit service to be able to best serve those who need transit the most? So taxpayers are funding more than 80% of that uh, public transit. Yes, if we're doing well. Uh, yeah, so transit will always need to be subsidized. Um, and so the, uh, we get various funding sources, but to, to answer the basic question, yeah, it, it's subsidized by, by taxpayers. Yeah, okay. And I am excited about the, uh, the skate park because I get a lot of calls about that too, and the dog park. I do also get a lot of calls about young people and older people, I guess, inside the skate park using it now regularly. I get pictures about twice a week. Um, also, a lot of people out playing volleyball. And um, I've got loads of pictures from people who keep sending them. And, you know, um, just a, a heads up. Yeah, appreciate Thanks. that. Paul, would you talk a little bit about the fare reduction program that the SCA has been able to use very effectively with Fairfield to soon transit, particularly for those folks who are 80 years and older, they ride free. Yeah, so it's a program that we work with, with like you said, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, with SCA. Um, we definitely um, uh, see uh, transit as a, as a lifeline or a resource for, for our seniors. Um, and so, whereas the, you know, the, it's a great service to them, but it's a minimal impact, right, as far as, far as revenue uh, to, to be able to provide that service to seniors for free. Um, and so there's programs that uh, through the help with STA, we've been able to provide, and we hope to be able to continue to do so. Yeah. And without public transportation, it would be very difficult to sustain the economy throughout the greater Bay Area. And, and that applies to the the capital corridors also, please. Yeah. So good question, Councilman Moy. Yeah. Any other comments, colleagues? 
Uh, I have a question. Yes, uh, Doris, go ahead, please. Hi, Paul. I had a question regarding, I know the ridership has is significantly reduced recently. Um, so how does that impact the number of buses out the routes and then also the staffing? Are you, has anybody been let go or are employees being, give, get, being given other jobs to do? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, we're, we're about 65% um, uh, fair route, uh, fair revenue hours or a service, right? And service has dropped about 65% um, uh, <clears throat> from normal pre-COVID times. Um, as far as staffing goes, no, we haven't had to, to let anybody go that the, and, and haven't had any of those discussions. Uh, the, but the challenge is that our, um, the cost for providing that service even at 65% is pretty close to what you have to have um, at 100%. Um, and so, <clears throat> like I said, mentioned earlier, the, um, the CARES Act funding has been able to you know, help bridge that. Uh, and, but you know, this year over the next several months, we're gonna need to figure out um, you know, how, do we, how does it look like um, in the coming years. Okay. Any other comments, colleagues? Well, Paul, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And it's encouraging to know that you're very much aware of the aging infrastructure in the city of Fairfield, public buildings and facilities in particular. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. City Manager. So Mr. Mayor, we have three more presentations. If the council would like to take another break now, we can, or we can wait until after this next presentation, then take a break and then finish off with the last two. So I'll leave that to the council to decide. If you need to take another quick break, we can. Uh, we are running about 10 minutes behind right now on the schedule. Do you need a break now or can you wait for after this next presentation? Let's press on then, please. Okay, so next we have uh, Parks and Recreation and this is our new Parks and Rec uh, Director, Christina. Good morning. Can everybody hear and see the screen? We got yes, it. Yes, we can. Right. Thank you. Greetings, Honorable Mayor and Council, and thank you to our public residents who are joining us today as well. It's my privilege to provide to you an overview of the Parks and Recreation Department. And um, our public service focus is really on quality of life through our recreation and leisure service opportunities. We do program throughout the community at various city-owned uh, facilities, the park sites, and then also on uh, through a partnership with our school district on some of our elementary and junior high school sites. So I'm gonna just quickly go through um, the slides here. Hopefully I um, will be able to do so. <laughs> Great, it worked. So our organizational chart, um, we have kind of uh, structured ourselves in three main areas, adult and youth service, opportunities, administrative services, and then aquatic sports and facilities. And really for the adult and youth services that encompasses a lot of our senior programming, our leisure activities, classes, preschool camps, and then our admin is really our internal service um, support to all of our program activities and events, things like payroll and personnel, and then also our customer service piece with registration. And then our final division, aquatic sports and facilities, again, direct programming. This is where all of our swim, rec, our open swim, our swim lessons, the facilities as far as um, both for our program support and then for the general uh, community use. So day-to-day -day functions, as I mentioned, are, um, include some of our programs like preschool, um, we average about 175 to 200 individuals um, through that program that's housed here in our community center. Our after school programs, we kind of have two different areas that we serve. We do uh, through a grant through ACES where we're on the school campuses at six elementary schools and one junior high. And then we have seven locations where we offer our life after school program. And again, those are at various community center locations. Our youth camps, we have um, regular annual spring break, winter break, and then summer camps. And there's a variety of different um, themes or activities that go along with those camps. Our youth sports programs, 
We um, actually do facilitate quite a few of other service providers that offer um, formal sport leagues through our uh, use of park sites. And then we also have um, differing uh, youth programs that we uh, function ourselves, um, like kids love sports, primarily our soccer program with that. And then also we have a youth commission that is actually an adver advisory committee to your council. And those young folks represent teens to young adults and really help serve as um, partners with us determining the needs of that demographic. And they serve in a, a formal capacity to you advising where and what the youth needs are here in our community. So also with uh, our primary functions, we, as I mentioned earlier, our aquatic programs that include swim lessons, our, our open rec swim. And I will note on some of the statistics there that we have about over 30,000 uh, uses for the rec open swim. And then we host and coordinate a variety of fun one-time special events out at the pool complex. Um, leisure classes and activities, these range um, within all of our different main program areas. So it could be things like cooking classes, dance classes, karate, those type of things that we would categorize more as short term or one time activity or events, not league play. Um, our senior day program is very robust and uh, again offers a variety of social activities. Um, probably our most uh, attended programs through there are concerts, meals, and then our trips that we um, obviously pre-COVID time uh, were able to offer quite a few differing opportunities for that um, demographic. And then special events, and this um, is supporting our major events here in the community. We also uh, have some what I call department sponsored events. We do movies out in the parks, and then um, we had a very successful Dia de los Muertos um, activity or event that was uh, coordinated through this department as just examples of what we do there. And then facility rentals, um, we offer our community centers for private use parties. We all obviously do some of our programming through those facilities. We also um, serve as partners to our inner department use for maybe testing or interviews and those kinds of things. Um, and then within this function of facility rentals, we do have a team that provide custodial services for our um, facilities here um, in the department. So like, um, not unlike all of the other departments, we have had some constraints with COVID, but I will say that we have an amazing team, uh, very passionate people within the department and so they came up with some creative opportunities during COVID and we're continuing to brainstorm and we'll be implementing some new programs that we'll be rolling out shortly. But just a, a handful of some of the things that staff created were um, things like the curbside coffee and crafts. This was geared towards our senior population and um, outdoor bingo. And then um, one of the things that really just um, gives you an idea of the heart of our staff that um, they implemented what's called thinking of you cards. So staff is taking the time to handwrite cards to our uh, core participants in both the senior area and our preschool to try to keep those relationships and, and uh, connections um, going. And then, um, you know, some of the challenges that the department has um, faced over the last year, obviously with the COVID changes with the um, protocols and what we could or could not do safely with regard to programming. But then also we had quite a few um, departures of staff through uh, re retirement, promotional opportunities, interdepartmental here within the agency, and then just a change of life for some. And then um, communication and collaboration, again, primarily due to the changes in how we operate um, has been um, a little bit suffering just with the lack of ability to get together and keep that as robust as we need. So major initiatives and, um, you know, we are looking at, and you've heard this really across all the departments. And one of the things that I found um, really important for me coming here to Fairfield was really 
having community engagement be a top priority for us as an agency. And most certainly with the changes in our programming and the needs of the community, we need to make sure that we're proactively responding to the changes in those needs. So we're gonna be formalizing over the next several months, a comprehensive plan of how we're going to get out into our community during COVID and, and post COVID, um, having regular opportunities ongoing. And then um, with that, we are also right now, I mentioned earlier briefly that we are um, as a team coming up with some creative program development um, again for the immediate and then um, even post COVID, we will be seeing definitely some dynamic changes in how we are um, providing our programming and activity opportunities. And then we really want to focus on rebuilding uh, relationships within our community. Um, really looking at how best to leverage our resources. So the collaboration efforts will be um, um, really something that we want to get back in a real formal manner, robust, and ensuring that um, we're not duplicating services. That's another key of collaboration is that we're leveraging resources to do the best service provision to our community um, across agencies. So this includes looking at our um, other departments, like our um, youth services that were identified through the police department's presentation. Um, the fire department does uh, some of the youth outreach. And then with our other um, nonprofits, the school district, our main street, all of those stakeholders that we um, create uh, opportunity for us to regularly communicate and respond to the changing needs. So really fostering and strengthening those um, taking advantage of some of the um, opportunities with use of the youth commission and getting, um, you know, that voice heard and then re-engaging with our um, funders, whether that's through state and federal grants, our local foundation, Fairfield Foundation, to uh, look at revenue enhancements um, to be able to um, prioritize and uh, decision making on what we do and when we do it. And then really, um, again, you heard a lot of this across our different departments is uh, really being more comprehensive in our planning, um, both short and long-term planning for us looks at what are some of the new service expansions that will come through our community engagement, where um, can we leverage and really identify some of the existing programs that have been very successful. We need to look at maybe how we can grow those or expand those throughout the community and then with all of that is identifying our staffing needs for the department. And one of the things that I really feel that we um, are ripe for with um, both the general plan update and some of those other formal um, plans is to really uh, re-look at our parks master planning as it relates to park development, but then also to include a formalized strategic plan as it relates to um, our um, program, program offerings. So, um, you know, I think we're all um, ready to get back to kind of what we keep saying back to some uh, form of normalcy and, um, you know, programming and really just wanting to get back out into our community. That's what we are here as public servants is to service our public in the best way that we can and to meet the needs, the ever changing needs of our community. So um, with that, I will do my best to answer any questions that you may have. And if um, I can't uh, answer them today, I will come prepared tomorrow with anything that I would need to follow up with staff or get stats for you. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, colleagues, questions? Christine, thank you very much. Turn it back to Mr. Sk and I'm just really realizing my video was off that whole time, so I apologize for that. No, we really appreciate it and welcome aboard. It's good to have you here. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship you have with the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District as well as the Travis Unified School District? Because parts of the Travis District are in the city of Fairfield as well. Yes, so um, I can speak to that we are at six of the elementary schools with our ACES program, which is an after school, it's a grant funded after school program, and also at the uh, junior high. And I'm trying to find my notes to give you the actual school sites, but that is something that I'd be glad to report back, back to you on. 
I think it'd be wonderful if you could meet with that superintendent as well. The Travis yes, Shows and, and that is speaks to our desire with the collaboration is just strengthen and really identify those opportunities where we do need to have more of that discussion with, um, I, I like you heard from somebody else, the like service providers so yes. that we are not duplicating services and our role could then be filling in the gap where those services are not being provided. And that, that crosses um, after school use services, our adult um, activities and leisure activities, our senior population, all of those things. So as we um, can and get back into a, a more routine way of communicating with those key, what I'm calling stakeholders that provide similar services to what we're, we're function and what our function and programming normally is. Okay, sir, next up we have uh, community development and that will be our assistant city manager, David Gassaway. David, w welcome aboard. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, can you see my slides there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, well, uh, as Stefan mentioned, David Gassaway, I am assistant city manager with my uh, primary role as director of community development. Um, community development department is uh, comprised of three divisions, economic development, planning, and building services. I like to view these three divisions as sort of a continuum uh, from uh, attracting uh, new development and businesses all the way through uh, seeing them constructed and making sure that they're done so in accordance with uh, building safety requirements and with uh, health, life, safety in mind. Uh, quickly running through just some of the day-to-day -day duties of those divisions. Um, economic development uh, has kind of three primary functions, business attraction, business retention and support, and then site selection support and negotiations. Uh, business attraction is really sort of our marketing. That's us uh, putting out there uh, all of the um, advantages that Fairfield has from a business perspective. Uh, uh, as we're building our economic development um, functions and really kind of building a program, uh, that's putting out the data that uh, businesses need, brokers need, site selectors need, so that they know uh, exactly what it is Fairfield offers from a business competitiveness standpoint. Um, business retention and support, that's, that's really uh, doing things to support our existing businesses that are already here in Fairfield. Um, we do that in a variety of ways. Um, you know, we partner with Small Business Development Center and the Solano EDC, Workforce Development Board, Chamber of Commerce, Main Street Association. Um, we are uh, starting to uh, really focus in for this, uh, for 2021, on a lot more business outreach, connecting with our businesses uh, to make sure that we're hearing from them, uh, hearing what their challenges are so that we can be uh, developing educational opportunities or programs uh, to assist them. Uh, we recently brought on board a new um, CRM or customer resource management program, uh, think um, Salesforce, so that uh, we're being more sophisticated and, um, you know, uh, and calculated in the way that we're doing that outreach and making sure that we're being responsive uh, to our existing businesses. Uh, and then that third category, site selection, support, and negotiation, uh, that's really once we have a business or a broker who has a, a client who's interested in coming to Fairfield, a lot of times uh, they may be looking at Solano County as a whole, looking at Vacaville or, um, or Fairfield or any of the other communities. Uh, and that's really then where economic development steps in uh, and identifies either um, uh, incentive opportunities or uh, streamlining or acts as a business advocate within the organization uh, so that we can really make it um, you know, clear that Fairfield is the best choice uh, for them to expand or, or uh, relocate their business to. Uh, the planning uh, division has sort of two primary functions. The first is long range planning. That's really where we're setting the, the policies and the guidelines for which we want to see the community develop the patterns of development that we desire. Uh, we do that through specific plans like Heart of Fairfield or uh, the train station specific plan. Um, we've heard from a couple of the other department heads thus far that uh, we've just kicked off the general plan update. That's a comprehensive uh, uh, project over the next couple of years uh, with the goal of uh, bringing uh, that general plan update document to the city council by uh, end of next year. 
Um, but long range is really uh, looking down the road at, at, at where the community is going, how we're developing, uh, and making sure that uh, all of that stuff's in place. Uh, and then the other function is more of the current planning. And current planning is where applications are coming in, projects are coming in, uh, and, and uh, this really uh, ranges from um, very big complex projects. So uh, for example, doing um, uh, PUDs, which are planned unit developments. So uh, one lake or the villages, uh, neighborhoods where you've got hundreds and hundreds of housing units that are being planned for uh, and doing the approvals for those. Uh, as well as uh, very, you know, sort of minute things, um, approving signs or uh, a use permit for a business, um, you know, the, a new tenant that's locating in a, a commercial center. Uh, under current planning, we also do uh, all of the CEQA review, um, which again can range from very big complex uh, environmental impact reports down to um, just uh, exemptions and, and um, you know, placing the paperwork uh, there on that stuff. Uh, the planning division also manages the planning commission. Um, last year uh, in 2020, we had 10 meetings. Uh, looking back over the last few years, uh, we ranged anywhere from about 10 to 15 meetings a year. Uh, we, I, I really pay attention to the, the projects that are coming into the planning department under that current planning, because that then is really an indication of what we should expect to see on our building side. Uh, in 2020, we had 346 projects that came in. Uh, and um, our building department had uh, a very busy year. And so the building division uh, has uh, three primary functions that it serves. Um, permitting, which includes uh, the intake of plans uh, and applications for building permits, um, the plan check, reviewing those plans to make sure that they uh, meet building code requirements. Uh, and then once we issue the permit, uh, it gets kicked over to our inspections um, team. Uh, who goes out and ensures that so the contractors that are building are building them to the plans that we've approved uh, in accordance with the building code. Uh, and again, with the primary goal there of uh, just ensuring life safety with the buildings that are constructed in Fairfield. And then uh, in this last year, we uh, transitioned business licenses that used to be in our planning division. Uh, we actually transitioned that over into the, the building division uh, for some economies of scale and really just efficiency purposes. Um, it just uh, sort of made better organizational sense there. Uh, and so uh, that's another function of what they do. Uh, now, uh, stepping back a second, I said that the building department was very busy. Um, you know, COVID was certainly an impact in a variety of ways, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second. Uh, but the building department or building division was incredibly busy this last year. Uh, we issued almost 4,000 permits, did almost 13 and a half thousand uh, inspections. Um, but very tellingly, um, over the last five years, uh, the highest amount of development impact fees that we have collected uh, was uh, just shy of $22 million, and that was in 2019. Uh, in 2020, we collected more than $43 million in development impact fees. Mm. And so um, what that's really an indication of is while our permit numbers were up a little bit, it was the value, it was the size of the projects that were coming in um, that were really, you know, double any anything that we've done in the last half decade. Uh, and that was a couple of big apartment complexes. We had a lot of industrial development that came along. Uh, and so it, it really kept our building division uh, very busy in this last year. So um, the challenges, uh, now I'll come back. It's certainly been a theme throughout all of the department heads today um, and just the impacts that COVID-19 has had uh, on our community, had on the city uh, and the services that we offer. Um, ultimately, when we're looking at um, COVID-19 from an economic perspective, kind of from the economic development lens, though uh, construction uh, worked, you know, construction was up and we were busy in, in that regard, um, the impacts of COVID-19 were really on lower income, frontline service workers, retail workers, restaurateurs, hospitality industry. And so uh, what we see is really uh, COVID-19 accelerating some macroeconomic uh, changes, ground shifts that were already going on uh, in the economy, mostly as it relates to online sales. So, you know, for the past decade, um, it's been widely talked about how, um, you know, brick and mortar retail uh, is, is struggling to compete with online sales. Um, but as COVID-19 came along, and it was unfortunately um, lower income, more marginalized populations that were the ones that lost, um, you know, their employment, 
um, the uh, higher income white collar professional um, sectors of the economy, um, those workers really just moved home. And as they moved home, um, they were had to some extent uh, in ways um, savings, right? They, they weren't traveling or weren't commuting for work, um, you know, didn't have to pay for dry cleaning, they weren't going out to restaurants as much. Uh, and so what we saw was this vast acceleration of online sales. Um, and, and so uh, the impact of that is um, is great. Um, you know, I put a stat up there. Um, one, one national estimate is that by the time this pandemic is over, we will have lost 100,000 retail stores uh, across the country. Uh, and uh, I saw an estimate just the other day that already, unfortunately, uh, more than 100,000 small businesses uh, in the United States have been lost. And certainly we've felt that here uh, in Fairfield. Um, right now, um, we are running uh, just a little over a 6% commercial vacancy rate. Um, and that um, is, it tends to be higher in our uh, strip centers uh, and it's the highest in our downtown where we're running about a 14% vacancy rate. Uh, and we certainly know that we've lost a, a number of businesses there. Um, and so uh, as we had these shifts, right, more e-commerce um, restaurants have also had this ground shift where um, these business models like DoorDash or Uber Eats were sort of these burgeoning, um, you know, technology platforms. Um, got just accelerated during the pandemic. And what we don't yet know is what those effects will be. Certainly, a lot of us want to be able to go back out with friends and family, go to a restaurant, not have to do the dishes every single night. Um, but, um, you know, as, as the pandemic, as we get past the pandemic, what we don't yet know is what those types of technology platforms, what their long-term impact will be on some of our brick and mortar retail uh, and uh, restaurant services. Um, uh, one of the other things uh, that we have as a challenge um, from an economic development and development perspective is um, all, I'm calling it sort of external image. Um, we recently brought on a consultant that's helping us to put together our uh, long-term economic development strategy. Uh, one of the components of that is uh, they've been conducting interviews. And so they've been going out to uh, various business sectors, to uh, commercial real estate brokers um, here locally, as well as regionally, uh, and, and simply you know, interviewing them on um, a variety of facets for uh, doing business in Fairfield. Uh, I put a couple of quotes up here. Um, but I just know anecdotally from my experience, you know, I started here uh, right at the end of last March. So I came in right as uh, the city and, you know, most of the economy was being shut down because of COVID. Um, but as I, uh, you know, my first couple of months, we started looking for a home here. Uh, and I heard from a lot of people saying, oh, okay, well, so you're going to move to Vacaville, um, which surprised me, which was sort of shocking to me. Um, but it's this external image factor um, and it's something that uh, with our economic development strategy, that marketing, that message that we're sending, um, we're going to be working closely with the marketing and outreach uh, division and city manager's office um, to really be uh, identifying the advantages that Fairfield has to offer and selling that optimism and really portraying that message. Um, and some of this even comes down to the language that, that we ourselves use. Um, certainly, homelessness is a challenge for us. Um, homelessness is a challenge for um, all of Solano County, for all of California. It's a, I mean, it's a challenge uh, across most of the United States um, as economic disparities um, are, are just uh, being exacerbated. Um, but, you know, as we think about the way uh, folks outside of Fairfield may look at Fairfield, um, you know, some of the language we use may have impact. So, you know, if we already have um, like this one broker who's saying that they've brought retailers here, but they think too much crime, low incomes, not enough population. Um, if someone starts looking under the hood a little bit at, at whether or not they're going to expand or move their business to Fairfield, uh, and they hear, you know, us just constantly talking about this, you know, uh, all of the problems with homelessness, despite our problems with homelessness not particularly being worse. In fact, we're probably in a better position than if you go to Sacramento or San Francisco or some of the uh, suburbs that, that are on the outskirts or, you know, right on the boundary of these bigger metropolitan regions. Um, you know, we're, we're not, uh, you know, our homelessness challenges are not as great as theirs. And so, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about that messaging from an economic development perspective and how we can come, you know, overcome some of this. And then as it relates to our business friendliness and getting projects approved, 
Um, you know, this is something I've also heard from the development community where um, historically um, we were we were you know really fast at processing things that we've slipped in that dynamic, um, and so that's something that when I get to our initiatives, I'll I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing, and then the last challenge that we have is. Um, and this is where, you know, partially the general plan comes into play. Um, when not accounting for the northeast area of town where we've got a lot of homes developing, there's opportunity for commercial and industrial, uh, but it's going to be five to 10 years down the road before that, that land is available. Um, right now, we do a, an inventory of available sites for commercial and industrial uh, development. Um, we're pretty limited. Um, you know, the city is starting to build out to the extents. Now, the advantage of that is that starts to force development back in. And so part of Fairfield, for example, is really a plan that identifies redevelopment and increasing densities. Um, but redevelopment and increasing density uh, as an infill uh, has, has with it its own challenges. Um, Financially, uh, it's a little bit more expensive to do that because if you're going to buy a building that you're going to redevelop, um, it likely has a revenue stream that it's generating for its owner. So you have to pay for that as well as uh, un unknown challenges that may come with, with um, you know, once, once you're into that project. And so um, though that's just going to be a challenge for us as well as um, sort of uh, continuing on the COVID conversation, um, market uncertainties around certain segments hospitality, restaurant, retail, even commercial uh, office space like class A office. Um, and what I mean by that uncertainty is right now, um, there's uh, you know maybe local developers who are interested in a site and doing a project, uh, but they're having challenges getting the financing in order to do their projects. We had a, a hotel project up off of North Texas and Manuel Campos um, that we recently renegotiated that development deal on. Uh, because they just could not get the financing because no industrial lenders right I'm, I'm sorry um, institutional lenders right now are investing in hospitality because of the way that that segment uh, of the economy has been decimated by COVID and it's unknown when that will really come back um, unknown when that will really come back so um, these are these are challenges that we're, we're trying to figure out so how are we responding to them? Well, um, there's a few different things we're doing. Um, going back to the, the comment about our um, sort of development friendliness and our timeframes, um, we're, we're spending a lot of effort to modernize our operations. Um, we've kicked off an internal review of our uh, process. So um, from you know application submittal to the time that we're able to issue a permit, we're looking at all of the steps in that process, um, figuring out where we can unkink pipes, where we can remove unnecessary steps. Um, where we can modify our codes uh, and our regulations in order to streamline those processes um, so that uh, ultimately um, for developers what they really what they really desire is cost and time certainty so if we can tell them exactly how much our approvals will cost and exactly what the time frame is um, then that's then that's sort of the uh, a gold standard for them so we're looking at that we're also bringing on board some um, new technologies um, you'll hear tomorrow uh, from uh, our finance director a little bit about the uh, ERP or the financial uh, software system that we're bringing on. Um, in concert with that, we're also going to be upgrading our permitting system uh, so that we can offer more online services, uh, better improve our efficiencies, standardize our permitting processes across the organization, uh, and really just um, you know implement best practices. Uh, I mentioned the economic development strategy. Um, the two uh, segments that it's really sort of lasering in on is Heart of Fairfield downtown. How do we get that revitalized and get some of those high vacancy rates um, down, uh, as well as our uh, commercial and industrial parks? Um, how do we go find the right types of businesses that may be outside of the community that are interested in, in uh, expanding or relocating? How do we message them? How do we market them? And how do we really get them excited and interested in moving to Fairfield? Uh, we expect that to be moving forward here over the next couple of months. So uh, as of right now, we're tentatively planning on coming back to you um, by the second meeting in March um, to present the findings of that strategy, uh, which will then really guide how our economic development division uh, is focusing its ever efforts over the next couple of years. 
Um, we've talked about the general plan update, major undertaking. I won't get uh, into too much detail there. Um, Heart of Fairfield, obviously, that's a big uh, undertaking that, uh, that we're leading in the community development department. Um, at my last check uh, with the team, I think we have 37 different programs, projects, or initiatives that we're trying to advance right now for uh, revitalizing uh, and implementing the Heart of Fairfield plan. Um, in fact, on, uh, at your meeting on Tuesday night, the Public Works is going to be uh, presenting you with a really exciting project um, to make it easier to do street closures and events and really energize downtown through events. Um, and you'll have your next quarterly update uh, on, on Heart of Fairfield. Um, and, and all of the things that we're doing, uh, the goal is that you know through 2021, as we start to come out of the recession, uh, that we'll have all of the pieces in place that, that makes it to where uh, we can be out there really trying to find um, some partners that are willing to come in and, and start, start to potentially take a swing at some redevelopment projects um, in, in the downtown. Um, uh, we've got a couple of housing projects uh, that we're hoping to advance this year, um, Simietto and uh, on Woolner Drive, which again will we'll start to help with that reinvestment downtown. Uh, and then uh, lastly, um, you know, we've got a lot of new development. Um, we uh, issued permits for 388 new single family residential homes last year. Um, those were predominantly out in the villages and, uh, and Cannon uh, um, uh, One Lake uh, developments. Um, those are still advancing. Um, there's some uh, next phases that we're now getting into, which are going to be some uh, big undertakings. We'll be coming back to you uh, here over the next few months with a couple of amendments to those development agreements. Um, those get very complex and time consuming, um, but they're very important to the uh, you know, future build out and success of, of, the, uh, of Fairfield, particularly from a residential standpoint. Um, so uh, I will stop there. Um, I, you know, it's a lot of information uh, and I'm happy to take any, any questions that uh, council may have. Any questions, colleagues? Councilwoman Moy, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, David, thank you for the presentation. Um, I am really happy to hear uh, that you're looking at streamlining the process to help businesses and builders um, as far as getting through that. I've also heard that over the years and it just has not changed. And so I'm glad you're making that one of your priorities. It's important and look forward to, uh, you know, the plans or ideas um, on uh, redevelopment it's so important for our entire city. I don't want us to ignore North Texas, and we are. And not really, but I'd like us to do the same kind of thing that we've done for the heart of Fairfield for North Texas. Um, that uh, full uh, thoroughfare is a hot mess over there. And, uh, you know, if we expect, um, if we have restaurants and those kind of things ready again after then we need to be too and make it welcoming. Um, I really wanna continue, I'll continue pushing North Texas. So I, I look forward to that. And then I have um, one question, uh, 5195 Fermi Drive, $85 million sale. What's going on in there? Do you know? Um, off the top of my head, I don't, um, but I can get you information back um, by tomorrow. Perfect. I've had a lot of questions about it. There was a story in the business journal. It was sold last week um, for $85 million here in Fairfield. It's one of the largest uh, around. So, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Tonneson, please. So, uh, David, thank you for the presentation. You said 37 programs or projects that you're working on uh, with the downtown. Could you touch on a couple of them? I know you and I have talked about a few items, but just just maybe two or three that are that are going for the for the businesses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, one is, um, like I said, uh, on Tuesday night, you'll be presented with a Bollard program. So one of the uh, things that we've heard um, is that doing events downtown um, can be uh, challenging, right? Um, so uh, in order to close streets to do, um, you know, festivals or fairs or even the farmer's market on a weekly basis, um, it takes a lot of labor right now. It's, it's intensive, it's time intensive. Um, and so uh, by doing a project, a capital project, uh, we can make that easy 
easier so that we can do more events down there. Um, we are uh, doing right now, we're, we're partnering with a, a property owner on a program that we call Retail to Restaurant. So one of the challenges in um, some of those older buildings down there that are um, you know, retail based is in order to convert them to a, a restaurant or food and beverage use, um, it's, it's really complex. Um, you know, there's uh, regulatory challenges, um, it's expensive. And so um, what we've done is uh, we've brought in an architect and we're, we're working to identify um, what the you know, standard uh, modifications are needed for uh, that particular building. Um, and then we will run that through our entitlement process. So as we run that through our entitlement process, it'll give in effect a checklist now for that property owner, uh, as well as any restaurateurs that we could go out and market to, to say, hey, if you wanted to locate a restaurant down here, here's, here's a building that we've identified as appropriate for a restaurant use. Uh, and here's the checklist of items that would be needed. Um, and it's already approved, it's already entitled. Uh, and so uh, we can work with not only the restaurants and the brokers on the side of attracting them, but also with the property owners on the side of saying, okay, well, here's what would be needed through those tenant improvements in order to make that happen, as opposed to them having to figure that out once they're you know, under lease uh, with, with, a, with a property owner. Um, we are, uh, we're advancing um, our uh, outreach down there. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, on the 16th, we'll be coming back with the contract uh, and, the, and furthering the conversation on Main Street Association. Um, but our economic development team uh, has started uh, to get out and really connect with businesses, find out what their needs are um, very directly. Um, so, you know, that's one of them. Um, we've uh, reinitiated a business watch program. So um, uh, one of our planners in partnership with uh, PD um, is doing a quarterly meeting with, with businesses on, okay, what are the public safety needs down there and how can we start to address those and respond to those? Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. If there's anything yep. else, we have talked a lot there, Mr. Tonneson. So if there's something specific you want me to cover, I'm happy to. Yeah, that, that was what I wanted you to cover. I know that we're, we're getting with some of those businesses and trying to, uh, you had talked about introducing them to some programs on the internet to, to drive more business to their, to their websites and things like that. But that's some exciting stuff. And I just wanted to touch on a few items. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Other comments, colleagues? Well, David, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Good reason for more optimism. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Mr. City Manager. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, our last presentation is from housing. So we'll get Latan on now and give him an opportunity to wow you on some of the programs that uh, he's working on and improvements that have been made there since he came on board. Well, that's encouraging news. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, Mayor and members of the City Council. Tan Jones, Director of Housing Services. Can everyone see the slide? Just want to make sure that's. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. Latan, we can see the slides, but we can't see your smiley face. <laughs> that's on purpose, or? Um, and that's fine. You don't have to show us your face, but okay. <laughs> so you, you, at least this time I got the slide going. So <laughs> I'll try to get my face later. Okay. Um, the mission of the um, the housing service department is to revitalize communities, provide affordable and mixed income housing, and provide rental subsidies to low income individuals and families in the city of Fairfield. We undertake that by offering services and resources in two division, the Housing Service Division, as well as the Fairfield Housing Authority. In the Housing Service Division, that division we promote development and various programs such as the CDBG program, home, Cal Home, just to support low-income families with grants and loans for home repairs, community revitalization programs, and the development and our rehabilitation of affordable housing. And then in the 
Fairfield Housing Authority. We administer the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher and Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Program that provide rental assistance for low-income households. The Housing Service Department is composed of approximately 12 staff members, and that's including myself. Um, and once again, in those two um, divisions, the Housing Services and then the Housing Authority. The Housing Authority has a total of six staff members, a manager, five housing specialists, and a part-time office assistant. And then the Housing Services Division is composed of, excluding myself, five staff members, excluding uh, which is a housing project manager that oversees our development activities, um, two management analysts, one focuses on the Community Development Block Grant Program and Special Program, and that's a new analyst that we just hired. And then the other analyst focuses on um, um, home repair programs, loans to below market rate um, buyers. And then we have a part-time construction project manager that essentially helps to manage any of the homes that we are undertaking with regard to um, loans or grants to low-income buyers. And then we also have an office assistant. Day-to-day, -day, the Housing Authority has regular customer service interactions, either by phone, documents, notices, and even in person in non-pandemic times. Staff responds to over 100 calls per day, maintains and monitors wait lists in both the tenant-based rental assistance and the Section 8 voucher programs that are composed of 562 or 904 households, respectively. Staff collectively completes about six to eight annual certifications a day, and that's in, in Fairfield. Uh, unlike some other housing authorities, the actual specialists do everything from A to Z with regard to an actual household. So in this particular case here in Fairfield, they have a lot more to do with each of the different clients than in other places. Staff also completes uh, housing quality standards inspections, poured ins and outs, which are vouchers for those who are either Fairfield voucher holders that want to go to another jurisdiction or resident from another jurisdiction that wants to move to Fairfield with their voucher from somewhere else. And then voucher payments are also processed and issued for all 806 of the households that, are, that have vouchers. Should any of the voucher holders have um, issues at their properties or landlords need to respond to tenant complaints, mitigate inspection violations or complete annual documents, staff also handles those landlord transactions that could be from any of our 757 landlords that we currently have on the program. Most of the daily functions in the housing services division involves the use of federal and state funds to promote development and other resources for the benefit of low and moderate income residents in Fairfield. We have the use of low mod um, home and CDBG funds to promote new construction and rehab development projects. Currently, we have just over about 500 units of housing currently in the pipeline. We also announced the availability of those funds via NOFAs and other notices that must be provided to potential applicants in a fair and transparent process in accordance with the federal and state regulations that we act under. Today, for instance, we are doing a NOFA for the CDBG program where we are actually trying to enlist those to um, apply for funding under the CDBG program. We also provide home loans and grants to Fairfield residents. These grants and loans help residents install accessibility features in their homes, as well as complete emergency repairs required to preserve the integrity of their homes. We construct, negotiate, and compose agreements with security instruments to facilitate our assistance and participation in all the programs we promote. These docs obviously memorialize the business arrangements with our clients and set terms for ongoing monitoring and compliance in accordance with our federal and state mandates. Finally, we correspond a lot with HUD and the state in completing periodic, periodic reports. We have quarterly reports, annual reports, plans and assessments required for all of the funding programs that we operate in with the state and the federal government. We have several challenges um, that we are going to be um, dealing with in our department, three of which I'll highlight today. 
Um, the first is that the Fairfield has a shortage of affordable housing and very limited resources to support the development opportunities. The city currently has approximately $2.7 million or so in the low mod and non-obligated home program income funds available to support housing. One project can easily consume those funds. For instance, we're working on a project with mid pen and we provided about $2 million in just low mod funds by itself. Additionally, the city has approximately 21 low income apartment complexes with um, a little bit over 1600 units of affordable housing currently in the city. And then based upon projections from ABAG and MTCS, Fairfield must construct another 1200 units or more in affordable housing over the next eight years. The next challenge is the housing department is new. So structure and process improvements are needed to create operational efficiencies. These efficiencies range from quality control, loan and document tracking, guidance and fair, fair field lending and proposal standards and uniformity in the operations. We need to make sure we have a good foundation to assure a sustainable future for the housing service department. And then the last challenge is the community is skeptical and uninformed of the activities and programs that exist within the department. So we simply need to develop mechanisms that better advertise first what our programs are and what our program guidelines entail. We then need to analyze and improve upon our services, which includes improving our overall responsiveness to our community and our constituents. We need to make sure that the public has confidence in what we do and how we do it. The major initiatives we will undertake this year, a couple of these I will include here. The first thing is actually construct the multifamily lending and development guidelines. And in these guidelines, we will establish reasonable fee structure for the loans. Uh, we will establish loan terms, conditions, and underwriting guidelines. And we will also establish comprehensive development guidelines for substantial rehabilitation and new construction that takes place within our city. We will also work with um, consultants um, to establish a bond issuance program. This program will give the city regulatory control of the affordable housing developments in the city and generate additional revenue to support affordable housing. As we work with the um, consultants that we already have on board, we will analyze the feasibility of initiating the program and mechanisms to generate buy-in from developers. This initiative will address revenue generation, accountability, consistency in operations, and clarity of goals and objectives. The next um, initiative will be utilizing the um, housing authority to establish a nonprofit affiliate to participate in and promote development in Fairfield. The many cities seeking to increase development of affordable housing have used their housing authority to help bolster development activity. The housing authority's regulatory structure allows the authority to form development partnerships, acquire land and properties, develop and form development partnerships with for-profit and nonprofit entities to promote affordable housing. Since Fairfield has, a, has limited resources, we're going to have to rely at least initially on development entities that can develop housing without a great need for local financing. A great deal of these developers may be for-profit developers that will need to partner with nonprofit entities or 501c3 entities to take advantage of tax exemptions and access tax credits and other resources available to finance affordable housing. So having a nonprofit 501c3 entity of uh, the authority would allow us to assist the for-profit developer in securing tax exemption, raise revenue to support additional affordable housing, maintain a key role in the developer partnership to assure that Fairfield interests are adhered to and assure that decent affordable housing is developed in our city. We are now in the process of assembling a strong team of development consultants that have a proven record of helping housing authorities form and initiate development projects. This is not a, a new model and it's really, really highly encouraged by HUD and has been done many times over throughout the country. I've actually personally worked in Sacramento, Oakland, 
and Richmond where this has been successfully done. Other places such as the Housing Authority of Portland, Monterey County Housing Authority, and Indianapolis housing agencies have all been other entities that have done it. That said, any project that we propose to participate in will always come with two choices. One choice to either have the Housing Authority's nonprofit affiliate involved in the project, or the other choice, obviously, for the nonprofit affiliate not to actually have involvement in the project. Now, one thing I do, I do want to make sure, make sure that we're clear of that we're, we're not attempting to take opportunities from other developers. With the RENA numbers and the RENA numbers are the regional housing needs assessment um, that's required by the state, there's plenty of work to be done. And we simply want to help stimulate development in a way that can help the city build capacity, increase revenue to support other developments, motivate for-profit developers to participate in affordable housing development, and enforce good quality development in the interest of the city of Fairfield. The next initiative is constructing policies and procedures for all our programs in our departments. Essentially, we wanna make sure that there's structure and consistency in all that we do. And so we have some programs that are already in operation and we really wanna make sure that we have good policies and procedures in place in order to be able to operate them efficiently. And then the last um, initiative is initiate a department-wide customer service campaign. The campaign will include greater information sharing on the website, customer service surveys of customer interactions, customer service training of all the staff, establishment of customer response times, and regular customer service assessment of staff interactions. In essence, we wanna treat our residents well and provide credible service to help them address critical needs in their lives. That's the end of my presentation and I'm available for questions. Comments or questions, colleagues? Let's Council see. member Tonneson, please. There we go. <laughs> hey, look, Tan, thank you. Hello. Um, so on the, the, the section need housing, this is more of a curiosity, I guess, on my part. I know the wait list or the wait time used to be a long, long time. Is it still? It is because there is um, a, not a lot of, of units that are available for Section 8 and our wait list, and like most cities, those wait lists will, will, will stay, you know, pretty much stable for a very long time um, because people are just not moving out of housing. And now with the um, COVID-19, landlords have gotten hip to the fact that Section 8 is probably one of the best ways to go yeah. because there's assured payments that are going to be coming from the government. So they know that at least 70% of the rent is going to be paid on time and regularly. So Section 8 is pretty popular. Okay. And then on, uh, you say we have 1,200 houses to finish within the next eight years. And then what? Are we done? No, or we're not done. And on population. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, eight years, um, the ABAG, um, Association of Bay Area Governments, actually get together and they come up with uh, an amount of affordable housing as well as just overall housing that the different regions need to actually provide in order to be able to meet the needs within the different regions. And so right now they have just actually um, start putting together information for the next round of, of housing that will be available. And so the numbers that we have just with regard to our affordable housing is just a little bit over 1200 units that we in Fairfield would need to actually construct in order to make sure that we are meeting the needs, the housing needs of those that are um, low income. And what are those numbers based on? I used to know. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I will say that I'm not, you know, the, the, the most well savvy in terms of the formula that, that are utilized, but they are, are looking at the, the availability spaces where it's available for housing. They're looking at the population. They're looking, of course, at, you know, some of the, the, the demographic information within the areas and they're identifying, okay, well, this area here, we expect, you know, one particular area, one particular county to produce a certain amount of housing. And then from that point, you know, they have pro rata shares that they would allocate toward either affordable or market rate or moderate income housing. So it's, right. it's a real complex, you know, formula yeah. 
that yeah. they utilize in order to be able to designate that. However, it's really, really important because every city has to make sure that we're able to meet those numbers. It seems like that we're all struggling to meet those numbers. I don't think we're Absolutely. alone. And with, 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 with um, low resources, it makes it even harder to do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Other comments, colleagues? Well, Tanya, wonderful presentation. Oh, oh, I just I have one comment, sorry, real quick. Hi, Lata um, I just wanted to say, I appreciate that you acknowledge that um, there is more effort needed with regards to communicating with the uh, with our community with regards to what your department is was, is taking, what you guys are your programs and what's going on. Because um, I had questioned regarding the apartment complex uh, where we have apartments, low-income apartments over in La Ventana or over there off Green Valley uh, Business Road. And I heard there was vacancies and I asked, well, how, how, are, how is our community finding out? Where are these being listed? Or, and I was told Zillow, but I know that we can do more. So I appreciate the fact that we are gonna be doing more to ensure that our community is aware of the programs and you know, just like a one-stop shop where they can get information on, on housing. So thank you. Right, and, and I will say that that is absolutely our goal to really become that one shop stop so that we will have information, you know, on, you know, we wanna work with the realtors and otherwise to, you know, so we know when there's homes that's available for sale, homes for rent and otherwise. So we, our effort is to try to make sure that we are established in that particular form. Very informative presentation. Thank you so very, very much. Thank Any you. other col comments, colleagues? Okay. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. This concludes our presentations for today. Uh, we have three more presentations tomorrow. That will be finance, human resources, and then the city manager's office. And we will also have uh, a presentation or a, uh, a workshop, I guess, uh, with our city attorney, Greg, uh, regarding um, the council manager form of government, the role of the council individually, collectively, expectations for a unified, a unified council. Uh, we'll talk some about now that we are in uh, districts uh, about, uh, about how that works and your role as not only being elected by district, but representing the entire city still. And so a uh, good discussion there. Be prepared to ask lots of questions uh, and uh, We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Brown Act there as well. There's, there's some great things there that you'll wanna be uh, in tune to. The end of, uh, we'll also have the, the mayor's committee appointments. And as I mentioned before, we will conduct uh, tomorrow's meeting similar to today's. There will be a uh, public comment period at the very beginning of the meeting. And then the only other time during the meeting where there will be public comment is during the mayoral appointments uh, for committees uh, because that is an action item. Uh, the very end of our meeting tomorrow, we will uh, uh, spend the, the remainder of the time talking about the direction that this council would like to go next. Now that we've kind of done this dump, if you will, of information, uh, we'll want to now get and glean from all of you uh, what are the areas that you want us now to really focus in on over the course of the next several meetings. Um, Council member Bertani already brought up, and I think uh, rightly so, homelessness is one of those big areas. And there's a lot of stuff that we need to discuss, a lot of detail there. So uh, my presentation tomorrow in the city manager's office is gonna be very, very brief when it comes to homelessness because there's just so much there to, to cover. There's no expectation that I'm gonna be able to provide you all of that information. It'll be a very brief overview in preparation for a much more detailed discussion in one of the coming meetings. Uh, so there's lots of things there. I've been able to get from you, uh, each of you in my conversations, some of your priorities, some of the things that you're looking at. So be prepared to kind of discuss, hey, this is one of the priorities that I think uh, we need to have a discussion on so that we can begin to schedule those out. Any questions for me or uh, what happens tomorrow? And Mr. Mayor, that's all that we have for today. Thank you so much. And thank you to the staff. You see, we've got uh, some great talent here on the staff. We're very blessed with that. Uh, you'll get to hear from some more tomorrow. And Council, I want to thank you personally for being very punctual this morning so that we could begin on time and look forward to a very productive day tomorrow as well. So thank you very much. And Pam, if you would stay on for just a second, please. 
Thank you. We are adjourned. See you guys. Okay. Take care. Uh-huh.